dudes, painters born to serve. Two Games Workshop. Hey, two is every word. On this podcast known as... Trapped Under Plastic, the official podcast of the state of Oregon. <laughs> Love you, Oregonians. So that one is of our uh, our own volition. Yeah. Uh, I just made it up now. But if you want your version of Trapped Under Plastic, the podcast where XYZ, you just put it in the uh, YouTube description down below in the comments section, and we will read that if it makes us giggle. Yes. It needs to be funny, okay? If you're not funny, don't bother, all right? That's what it comes down to. That's a pretty good uh, Creeping Death rendition right Thank there. Thank you. I've been practicing my Hetfield lately in the shower. Hey! Hey! Yo! <laughs> Look, he uh, says ice. It sounds like saying rice. Trapped under rice! It's like, wait, what? Dave? Oh, not Dave. James, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what Dave's doing. No, Dave. <laughs> Dave's over there complaining about the government and thrash metal songs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God damn, Dave Mustaine. <laughs> so there's, there's this trend of videos on YouTube right now where it's like, I'm doing this thing until this thing happens. And the thing happens like in a second. So it's like, <laughs> I'm going to freestyle in my car until I say something gay. And it's like 10 <laughs> seconds long, you know? And so I saw one recently that was like listening to Megadeth until Dave complains about the government. And it like happens in like five seconds. And he's like, fuck! And then he like stops. <laughs> um, but I love that format. It's great. Yeah, that's a nice, real quick instant gratification. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's comedic gold right there. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty good. I, I love how like we kind of moved away from like short form content and then like then it came back in a huge way with like TikTok and so we're yeah. seeing more like normal like uh 16 by 9 content that's like really short and like 15 seconds long. It's it's really funny. Oh, it's on its way out again though. Is it? Yeah, cuz they backed out of all the money in shorts. Oh, YouTube did? YouTube, TikTok, uh, basically advertisers. Or not? The, oh, the, the so the platforms didn't, but the advertisers did. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because there's okay. Think about every time you watch a TikTok or a Facebook Shorts or YouTube Shorts or whatever, you get to watch the 15, 20 seconds. Okay, and then every three or four of them, there's an ad. But what what do you get to do? Oh, oh, oh. so they it's there was very easy to to click away from the ad. Yeah. So okay, okay. Um. So the platforms dumped a bunch of money into paying content creators to do shorts, right? Yes, so, initially, yes. Yeah, so you saw it probably on Instagram or whatever. You got a big-ass Instagram. Yeah, it's like, hey, we'll give you a 1000 bucks if you make 30 million shorts or uh, reels, whatever they're called. Yeah, and so people were like, oh, God, there's money there, and, and then there, that's where the influx of, of creators came from. Right. And then all the advertisers have backed out, and now the, um, the platforms aren't doing that anymore. Mm. No, so they're backing, no more cash influx. They're backing it way off. Uh, okay, okay. So, um, damn it. I always be... wait too long to get into this. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know if it's a death knell of it. I still think that, like, I, I hope it exists, but I hope it doesn't, I hope it, I hope it goes down. <laughs> yeah, Because the people that do it because it's funny and they have a funny thing or whatever, it's like, you should still do that and people that are successful with it, they'll still do it, but it's just like, there's a bazillion of everybody in their, Fucking cut off jean shorts in their backyard, you know, God, yeah. slamming a Budweiser and shooting a duck or something. And you're like, what the fuck was this? Dude, the 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 bar of quality for shorts is extremely low. Yeah. Like there are some that are hilarious and they're and they're great, but man, there there are like the things that people make content of that I, I, I to me I don't even under, it wouldn't even occur to me. This is like worth making a video about. I also like I don't know how you feel about this, but I kind of like dislike the blatant asking for like followers but i guess it doesn't matter a lot but it's like if your whole video is just asking for people to follow you it's like you need to you need to do something to like, kind of like be able to earn the right to ask for it in a way i feel like if you just if your content is all just you know if you like follow me it's gonna help me out and make me make me really popular and it's gonna it'd be great for my small business and it's like dude you, you need to like Show me the value proposition here before yeah. you like ask for me to follow you, right? <laughs> like when they're like, so I can make more videos like this. I'm like, what? Some more videos? Are you just <laughs> <asking> <laughs> to follow you? Yeah, like, yeah. No, uh, yeah. It's it's a it's a earned thing, you know. It's I actually watched. I can't remember what YouTube video it was that I watched recently, and they did the usual, you know, like sixty percent of it was a Diablo four video. There's this ginger guy, uh, like DM Diablo or whatever. I really appreciate him. He's like to the point. He's very succinct. He, he's very articulate, but he does it off the cuff. Mm -hmm. But he he said just kind of in the middle of his video, no happenstance to it or whatever. He's like, you know, it's like sixty percent of you aren't subscribed, and I understand that. I haven't earned your subscription yet, mm -hmm. but I'm hoping that by the end of this video, I will have earned it. 
And it was just one sentence, boom, to the point. Yeah. And maybe it was my creator brain that that really like resonated with me. I was yeah, like, yeah, that's yeah. true. Like you need to earn someone hitting that subscribe button because they'll want to be notified of when your your next thing comes because they appreciate you. And I was like, God, that's right. Yeah. It's, you got to earn it. And you just you ask do. them for it with nothing to, to give you some meat and or potatoes. Yeah. What's taters? Both very important. What's what's taters, precious? Oh, God. It's Lord. weird. It's because like I, I watched a video from a creator called Blacktail Studio who's a, a carpenter, and he said the exact same thing. He used those exact words. Like he has to earn your subscription. I'm sure it's making this round. Yeah. And, you know, it's, and so, it, it's, it's a really good way to put it. So. It is. Yeah, it is a good way to put it. And it's also like, yeah. I, so I said something very similar, not in the video that came out today, but the one before that at the very end. I was like, you know, I put a lot of effort in my videos. I care very deeply about the quality. Like, if you uh, feel that, that that's not true, then you can unsubscribe. But, you know, let's, let's, let's give it a shot here. Because, yeah, like my numbers are similar. Like 47% of people that watch my videos are not subscribed. It's like almost half. It's crazy. I'm doing it live right now. He's doing it live. Dude, I'm going to do it live right now. I want to find out how many uh, listeners of Trapped Under Plastic are subscribers. You guys. Be f- you guys. I, I bet it's high. I bet it's 70%. 73 percent oh, ho, 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 baby of our viewers on youtube are subscribers god damn so that's that dude that's that's for youtube way to go goody pv nation way to go way wait, to wait, go. wait wait to sub no way to sub so 20 the 26 percent, 26.7 percent of you that aren't subscribed wait this doesn't add up to 100 percent. so there's many many small percentages with many small that are either subscribed or unsubscribed this feels like a light switch my friend <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm wrong. Wait, yeah, that should have to 100. percent Maybe YouTube the doesn't binary thing. YouTube doesn't understand numbers so much. Mm, that's a that's a bad sign for analytics. <laughs> <laughs> but if you are part of the 26.7 percent that aren't subscribed, we hope that by the end of this episode, we've earned your subscription. <laughs> You most likely haven't. Uh, anyways, out of the preamble ramble, uh, my Kickstarter is fulfilling, and it is fulfilling uh, me. Um, <laughs> I'm so happy that uh, NA and SA fulfillment is going really smoothly right now. It's uh, SA, South America? South America, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Canada is going, uh, America is going, Mexico is going, some South American countries that ordered are, are, are getting their stuff. And they're, it's arriving. It looks beautiful. The packaging is immaculate. Um, very proud of that. Uh, very proud of what uh, me and Angel Bomb were able to do, and also with uh, the fulfillment partners, uh, Flying Cloud, they did a great job. Very happy for that, and uh, just happy that people are are happy. You know, up until this point, it's been like, guys, guys, believe me, it's gonna look cool, okay? Like, trust me. And I, I you know, it's hard to trust someone, right? And I, so when they get it in their hands, and they're like, man, this is a, these are awesome models. I'm so excited. It just is so validating because like you don't have to believe me anymore. You can just look at the thing in your hands and make your own judgment call. And for for the most part, the judgment call is this is really great. Like I'm really happy that we waited, and that just feels really good. Really yeah. good. I've seen on the the social medias people having their pictures of receiving the product and like seeing the the packaging and the brush coffin and the models are in. I was like, yeah, dude, that's those look. Those look fucking primo. Dude. Thank you, man. Thank they you. Are, they are they are the high end and pushing the aesthetically pleasing getting the thing version yeah. of our hobby, which there is value in that. Yeah. And it gives you this feeling of, oh, yeah, I'm so glad that I backed that. or I'm so glad that I bought that. And then you open the box and there's that shiny ass brush case and stuff. I know. And that fucking lovely label, too. And Shing. I the love coffin, that label. Coffin. Th- shape thing yeah yeah it's got that embossed detail on it and the case i actually like how the case turned out glossier than i wanted it to turn out but it looks so different than the label itself label is nice and matte the case is glossy it just looks cool but yeah happy that that is finally starting to happen uh this we are you know i can see the kickstarter in my rear view mirror a little bit you know we're not fully past it yet but it's uh it's starting to get that way and it's good it's good uh happy to be here so when you said starting fulfillment in uh, North America and then SA, mm-hmm. I said I asked what SA was, but my brain immediately went to Super America. Yeah, dude, America, North America, and Super America. And I just assume that gas t- station. I, I, I just assume Super America just means Texas. <laughs> 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 Absolutely, what it is for all of the for for the for betterment and for worse. <laughs> Texas is super America. Yeah. Also, what if Texas seceded 
from uh north from the united states and they just renamed themselves super america that is absolutely what they should do it reminds me of fantasy fantasy flight game center that seceded from fantasy flight and named their uh place fantasy or no the game zenter with a z yeah fantasy flight game center to game zenter it's like okay yeah you didn't try very hard that's like what did did the, the person that came up with that name was like stuck in 1997 because that, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, yeah, is yeah, the, yeah. that is the prime era late 90s of naming your business with the letter Z instead of an S. Yeah, yeah. When you lose the game of 40K <laughs> there, someone comes out with a bucket of like green goo and like tips it on you. It's like, you got slimed, bitch. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> no. Oh, God damn. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. All right. So, Texas, if you change your name to Super America and become your own nation, I'll move there. He also has to be your president. And then that's how it works. No, there's no president. I'll be the emperor. <laughs> okay, the emperor of Super America. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'll have a great cabinet. <laughs> uh, it'll be me. Okay, here's my cabinet for Super America. Okay. It's gonna be me, Ted Nugent. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, like, Vince Venturella, but not even with Ted fucking Nugent. <laughs> I mean, I feel like if there's anybody that would understand uh, what it means to be Super America, it would be Ted Nugent. I mean, Chuck Testa. Wait, not not Chuck Testa. The other Chuck. Chuck Norris. Chuck, yeah, Chuck Norris. Van, uh, Chuck, Chuck Norris is, is the head of the Ministry of Defense. Okay, what about, uh, Van Damme? You get him there, too? <laughs> no, he's French-Canadian. I don't trust him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, me... Chuck Norris, Ted Nugent, Ted Nugent, and we need to have we need to have like a um, we need to have somebody that is probably um, okay. We need to diversify a little <laughs> bit too, right? Ron White, Ron White. You know who Ron White is? No, but he doesn't sound like much of a diversification. <laughs> so Ron White's a stand-up comedian. He's from the Blue Collar Comedy Tour. This does not sound like diversification, bro. Yeah. Well, I guess you're. I guess when I thought diversification, I thought of like different different segments of the population. <laughs> yeah. We, we, like, 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 like. We want a white Southern guy, <laughs> but I want him to be funny. <laughs> I was thinking like different industries. Yeah, yeah, no, I get it, I get it, yeah. Okay, you yeah. want a funny guy? Yeah. Also, probably like so we need a, um, okay, like we have real, we should probably have more real diversity. So Sigourney Weaver, <laughs> she's yeah. the biggest badass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I think probably Wayne Brady. Okay, yeah, because Wayne Brady is also oh, funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, he's like he's a. He's a clean family com- comedy. You yeah, know? yeah. He's he'll he'll everyone will appreciate. Who doesn't love Wayne Brady? I mean, I do. I mean, whose line is it anyway? Fucking gold, dude. Yeah, he was he was the star of whose line. Yeah. I, okay, they were all kind of fucking amazing yeah, at, at that. At what like I occasionally speaking of like clips and shorts. Yeah. <laughs> occasionally on my freaking feed of shorts, it gives me like. Maybe it's because I watch them all the way through. It gives me the shorts <laughs> from Whose Line Is It Anyway? Dude, YouTube, give me this shit in my fucking recommend. <laughs> Please, I need it. it. It gives me the Whose Line, and they're bangers. And I like I remember watching it when I was young of when it was on. You know, Drew Carey's the host. Yeah. But I didn't realize maybe at that age, but I appreciate it now, how fucking hard that would yeah, be. Yeah, dude. Just given a prompt, and there's like, go. And it's like com- comedic gold. Yeah. Like it's that, incredible. That improv stuff is like, that is a whole different wavelength of your brain. And I also think like there's classes and you can, you know, kind of go to school for that. Same with like stand up comedy and stuff. Like technically you can, but it's also you either have it or you don't. Your brain either works that way or it doesn't. Mm-hmm. And so to see people that are just like, all right, you're at a, you're at a restaurant and and a guy with a funny hat walks in. Talk about that conversation. Go. You're like, hey, guy with a funny hat. <laughs> <laughs> That's where my brain goes. Doesn't quite get there. <laughs> so, so uh, here's the uh, here's the podcast about whose line is it anyway? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now on to John's other preamble around topics that have nothing to do with uh, mini painting. What do we got? Vacation water park. Yeah, yeah. So water park uh this last weekend uh we did a three-day mini vacation with the family to, the dells? Uh, to wisconsin dells I get it. yeah it was just a three-dayer uh we hit up house on the rock in the wisconsin dells and we stayed at the great wolf lodge oh so you can so do you want did you go through the entirety of the house on the rock 
Rock? Yeah, we did. You been there before? Uh, I've been there. This is like my sixth or seventh time. Oh god, yeah. I, I, I assume as someone it. who's in like to architecture, I've definitely gone there at least once. Yeah. yeah, like it's a bit of me. I also think that there's a level of like the origin story of who I am lies deep in the house on the rock because wow. yeah, i first went there when i was like six years old okay and because you know you're in the midwest there's not a lot of driving destination uh, <laughs> like vacations you go to the fucking south dakota to see mount rushmore in the black hills yeah. which is fucking boring as a little kid <laughs> you can go to wisconsin dells and then you can go to like i don't know like valley fairs like a one day thing you like go lambo yeah, I've done you that. To the, too. You can go to the thumb of the mitten. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know. You go up to Brainerd. Yeah, like, nothing in Iowa. Literally nothing. <laughs> Same with Nebraska. Nothing. In Indiana. You know, other than Vince, he's the only thing in there, right? Vince is in Ohio, but yeah, you got to. Wait, didn't you say Ohio? Oh, you said Iowa. Okay, Iowa. My, my bad. My bad. Iowa. Yeah, Ohio is also an armpit, but um, <laughs> there's not much. So when I was a little kid, I went to House in the Rock, and one, my interest like in weird, crazy architecture, but two, it's so macabre. And every time I go as an adult, I realize how fucked up that place is. Yeah, yeah. It's so like dark and sinister, and like figuring out the history of this dude that made this, like he is a fucking wacky weird weird like yeah he's kind of weird like bachelor for life thing and just like i don't know where he got his money to do all this like his like his dad was a they say his dad was a real estate agent but they don't really say a whole lot and okay, like, okay. i think there's probably some mafia stuff with chicago so it's kind of close <laughs> i don't exactly know but it's just it's so weird and creepy and i didn't realize how weird and creepy it was until every time I go I, I re-remember it my daughter was freaked out she acted as we were going through that place like it was a haunted house and something was going to jump out at her oh, all the time just like high anxiety yeah. yeah she was like and we'd go through like entire sections or rooms and shit where she would just like put her hand over her eyes and like hold on to my arm and I just like walk her through like she was a blind person yeah because she just did not want to look at stuff and it's like every every room is like it's covered in carpet floor to ceiling yeah. and these weird mechanical um like music things everywhere yeah mannequins and puppets and everybody knows mannequins puppets and clowns are fucking freaky yeah the whole merry-go-round thing that's like just gigantic and so many different horses it's like really it kind of looks like a gateway to hell if i'm being totally honest uh it's not that creepy if like you're thinking about going to it and you live in wisconsin you should definitely go to it but it is there's definitely this uncanny valley kind of yes. like eerie feeling for sure yeah and everything is I really appreciated this time for the first time, really appreciating the lighting of the whole thing. Okay. Because everything is lit in a way where there's no lights on anything that you are doing. Any of your walkways, any of your kind of observation spots or wherever, there's never lighting on you. There's only lighting um, and it's fairly minimal on the stuff you're looking at. Okay. So you can't look at it in direct daylight to kind of see the the inadequacies of it and, and everything is it feels like the lighting is put there for a certain reason so any lighting on you is just like faint bounce light and you just feel like you are in this dark tunnel and you have to observe the way that they want you to and i don't know how much of that is done on purpose i'm guessing a certain amount but it just it adds to the atmosphere in such a creepy creepy way um so that was that was a, a fun experience the great wolf lodge Part of Wisconsin Dells, the uh, uh, water park capital of the world, mm -hmm. and had a giant ass built in water park um, there because my daughter loves swimming and stuff. So I'm like, we're just going to stay there. And then she would have stayed there for like a month and a half and just went <laughs> to the water park every day. Um, but this was kind of a big thing for me because two things happened over, the, over this weekend. The first thing was um, this is my first family vacation. So I consider like going to conventions and stuff. I kind of consider them vacations, but they're also work and they're not with the family. Um, I've done those, but this is my first family vacation since starting my YouTube channel. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So it was just, I mean, we've done day trips and that kind of stuff, but you know, you know but nothing where it's actually feel like you're, you're going on vacation. Okay. Um, and it lined up with the, while I was gone over the weekend, my channel hit 200,000 subscribers. Congratulations. Over the same weekend. So it was kind of in an odd way. Didn't expect it. Didn't really kind of think about it until we were there. It was like almost like a little celebration, which was which was really nice uh, to spend that with my family. But yeah. I, I realized like how when you kind of have to 
do it all yourself and you you have your channel and you are your own boss and if you don't do it, it doesn't get done mm-hmm. how often these kinds of things it just kind of has slipped away and i haven't prioritized them or i haven't made made time to do that and i organized uh, usually my wife is the amazing person that does all the organization of things like trips and stuff and i did all of this one and i was like you don't worry about anything you just get in the car and i'll have it all figured out and that felt good too to be like i can do this i can make the time i can do the organization i do the research and it felt really good and my daughter had a great time um but there's a couple other things on my trip i wanted to talk about (laughs) okay First thing too, I didn't. We were there. We were gone for three days, and I didn't poop for three days. I'm just gonna say it. Are peepees. you one of those people that when you travel, you don't poop? Or this is a new phenomenon. No, I'm that person. You're that person. Okay, Amber is that person too. I just hate it, and I it makes like I don't like I like by the end of like the day one, like I have a stomach ache for the rest of Ugh. the trip, and it's like sometimes it ebbs and flows and stuff, but it's like I don't understand it. One, because you're kind of eating out a lot, so yes. you're not eating healthy. Yes. We brought a bunch of food and a bunch of healthy food. To, to eat there and I still was doing that I was like eating ve- <coughs> veggies and fruits and we ate our own brought our own breakfast to eat healthy breakfasts and um, the, it what, still didn't the, matter yeah, what's the deal you know it's the atmosphere I don't know what it is if it's just like I'm such a creature of routine that I get out of my routine and my body's like caution caution <laughs> no evacuation shut down the poop <laughs> yeah so got back home and I was like oh it was so fucking weird dude this is the dumbest fucking thing I walk in Park the car in a garage, open the door, let the dog out of his kennel, and immediately had to poop. Wow. I was just like, what the fuck? Dude, I don't know. Dude, That's like, weird. There's, there's some kind of biome or like <laughs> some kind of organism that's running running the parts of my body that are subconscious that I don't have control over like my breathing and my pooping and I don't even know what's doing that it's like a little men in black alien inside yeah, of you. it's like pulling the levers yeah. <laughs> it's exactly. like cl- close that lever for now yeah. he's like hey maybe he goes on vacation too so he just puts it on autopilot and he just closes he just the non necessary ones he puts a little sign <laughs> out for the weekend and then just fucking leaves he's just chilling at my house when no one's home yeah, all right little alien i'm on to you um the last thing i want to talk about one thing we went to as well is that um my daughter loves reptiles which she got for me because i fucking love reptiles and amphibians i'm a i'm a, I'm a herpy burpee and uh <laughs> excuse me <laughs> and uh we went to a place called alligator alley now i don't know if did you ever watch uh tiger king yes i did okay so tiger king was the first time that i was made aware of like privately owned yes, same zoos uh, yes private zoos very weird concept to me yeah. so i didn't realize that like every zoo out there was like like the st louis zoo or the minnesota zoo or whatever they have mm-hmm. like these publicly funded yeah like yeah. you know you think of them in a, a positive light mm-hmm. but there are a lot of privately owned zoos around the country um in specific states uh exactly um and Wisconsin is one of them because I learned that in Wisconsin is only one of five states where you can own whatever fucking animal you want, like in your house. At Alligator Alley, I could have bought an alligator. $349 for a baby alligator. Not even that expensive. No, I just bought a baby alligator. And you can own fucking monkeys in Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask if you own a chimp. <laughs> like, yes, you can. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if like at what level of the, the primate tree like they're like no 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 (laughs) not a gorilla yeah like i i don't know how like how smart the monkey needs to be before they're like nah that's too close to a person you can't own that yeah can't own that but um so there's a bunch of them in in the dells there's like four there's even a big cat one we didn't go to that one um but we went to alligator alley which is the only one we went to but um first of all the place was was really nice in the inside but i was freaked the fuck out because (laughs) When you go and you buy your tickets, you can buy tickets to feed the animals. <laughs> yeah, so you can buy meat to feed the, the alligators. Oh my god, bro! Dude, and you walk in; the place is not that big. You walk past the saloon doors. Not shitting you. There's saloon doors to go into the area, which is like a giant U-shaped, and there's giant aquariums all the way around, and it's really pretty nice. So, it the wall starts well. So there's a wall that goes up to about knee height, and then it's just like pure plexiglass from knee to ceiling and ceilings are probably 10 12 feet tall and it was like not smudgy not fingerprints everywhere not hazy it was like crystal clear like it didn't look 
like there was a glass there. And you walk in on your left, this massive place, a uh, massive uh, aquarium, I guess you'd call it, terrarium for the alligators. And they're all right in front staring at you. And the reason why is there's little holes right above that area where you can feed them. And they are just sitting there waiting. Oh, boy. And they, like, basically standing a foot from a dozen alligators looking at you, I was like, this is these are fucking dinosaurs. Yeah, like, these yeah, things, yeah, yeah. They have cold, heartless eyes that they're like, I would eat anything. <laughs> and there was, when we walked in, there was a couple uh, a husband and wife, and they had a little baby, and they were holding the little baby. Yes. And I swear to fucking God, those alligators were staring at that baby, like throw that fucker in here. Oh, like a real baby, not an alligator baby. No, no, they were holding a baby, like a like a three month old baby human. Okay, their baby, I assume. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just like, no, these alligators would eat you. Yeah. You go in there, and they looked fucking starving. Yeah. Okay. So the last thing I want to talk about, the creepiest thing I saw. The entire time. Now, we went to Ripley's, believe it or not. We went to House on the Rock. But the single creepiest thing that I saw on this entire freaking trip was the end of Alligator Alley. They have a section where a bunch of smaller terrariums. And they had a cane toad in there. You ever seen a cane toad before? No, I have no idea what a cane toad is. So a cane toad is an invasive species. Originates, originates, I believe, in Australia. Um, but they're, they're invasive in the state of Florida which like most scary reptiles and amphibians, that's just where they live now, yeah. Florida. Yeah. And uh, they look a lot like an American toad, but they get fucking massive. Okay, how big? Like basketball size big? Um, they had a cane toad there that was the size of a fucking chihuahua. Nice. And the thing, I swear to God. That's a monster. It, it was this fucking big. That's a monster right there. Okay. <laughs> That thing, it looked it looked very unhealthy. Some of the animals there did looked unhealthy, which was sad, which is, you know, private zoo, who knows. Yeah. Um, I swear to God, if I were ever to say, like, you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, and you'd be like, oh, there's a zombie toad, that's what it fucking looks yeah, like. Yeah. It looked like a, get a goddamn picture? zombie. No, because I'm an idiot. <sighs> I'm terrible it, at taking pictures. Yeah, you got I'm, a social media better. Yeah, okay? maybe, my, maybe my daughter took one. I'll, I'll double check. Okay. She took a bunch of pictures, but because for her birthday, she got a phone, so... She uh, she take a picture now. Okay. So this thing, it looked, it was huge. Its head was like the size of a softball, but it was like emaciated. It had these really long, oh. spindly arms oh, with big, huge toes, long, spindly toes. And it looked like a fucking zombie. And I was like, holy shit. And just sat there. And its back was to you, kind of like in a horror movie when you walk into a dark, face. dark room, right? And there's a person, it's completely dark, it's completely soundless. You have a flashlight out, and you look around the flashlight in the corner of this completely dark room. There's a human being with their face to the corner. Yeah, and they're wearing a white like med like medical dress, and it's like kind of dirty. And then it's like like one frame later, they're like turn around and like one th from your face. Yes. Jump scare! Yes. But it's a cane toad in a white dress. I was just waiting for that jump scare from the cane toad. Yeah. So... My daughter wasn't scared of that. I was scared of that. Yeah. <laughs> a cane toad has haunted my dreams. So that's my uh, that's my vacation in a nutshell. All right. Uh, allow me to, for my last preamble, ramble topic here, just to do a little bit of math. That's going to be fun. So I, um, I don't have a lot of time to work on this little game that I want to make, but I'm very excited about it, and so I can't contain my excitement. I've been watching talks uh from GDC, from PAX Unplugged. They've been reading books about game design, both like uh, the theory of fun, uh, game tech, which is more about math and science and how it's related to gaming. Did you say math and science? Yeah, math and science. Math is very important when it comes to gaming. You, yeah, I think you so. get those three days of gaming in straight, okay? <laughs> uh, but there were really cool things that I learned about, and because, I was, because they were defined for me, I can now know what they are and I can design the game with them in mind. And I think you're gonna appreciate several of these. So there are many ways to categorize randomness in games, like uh, hidden information, like what your opponent is gonna do. But the one that we're very familiar with is something called randomizers, which is a, yeah. a D6, you know, right. D20, uh, drawing cards, flipping tiles, spinners, like in roulette, like these are all randomizers that you do something and a, a random event occurs. And so he categorized ra randomness in, in many ways, but some of the ways were this. You have a, a system that is uh, input randomness. This is where you are given a random set 
of an environment, you have to form a strategy around it. What's an example of input randoms that you're very familiar with? Uh, Magic the Gathering. Exactly. Get a hand of five cards, make a strategy now. And then yeah. whenever you get a new one, change the environment a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then you have another one called output randomness, where you're like, I want to do a thing, but that thing is like kind of gatekept by a randomizer. And a great example of that is... Any Warhammer. Game. Exactly. I want to attack someone. I'm going to roll a D6. Whether or not that's successful, it depends on the die roll. So that, that's input and output randomness. It, and it's helpful to define these things because it's like, oh, you know, I kind of like... I kind of like output randomness. And it reminded me of how attacking works in Guild Ball. I have a set number of successes. I get to pick what result I want. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like I'm given this options and I get to pick. It's, it's, uh, it feels more uh, empowering in that way. It's also not a, typically not an all or nothing. Yes. Oh, absolutely. There's all kinds of difference in, in many, especially in war games that are very complicated. Yeah. There's all kinds. Like in Warcry, for instance, you draw an environment or like a, a scenario for the game. Now I have to deal with that scenario. So that, that is a version of output random or uh, input. output randomness. Input randomness, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the other way they defined randomness was by calling it white noise, brown noise, or pink noise. And this is related to the audio as well. Um, so white noise is... I don't care what happened prior or what's going to happen in the future. What's happening right now is totally random. There is no reliance on the be or before or after. So an example of that is rolling a D6. Like nothing about what you rolled earlier or later affects a generic die roll. In some games, there are rules that, that do that. But normally, like my randomness and my luck is not going to impact my future rolls. It is always purely random or, or flipping a tile. It's like, I don't know what's going to be in that tile, but... It's just random. Um, the other version, brown noise, is highly reliant on prior states. And so, say for instance, you got a coin flip, right? You flip the coin, and if it's heads, you get plus one to your score, and if it's a tails, you get minus one to your score. So it's still totally random, but my score is only ever incrementing by one or two, and it's highly reliant on the last state. So if I have seven points, I know after this coin flip, I'm going to have either eight or six, like it, it, there's no other state's gonna occur. Whereas, you know, white noise is totally random. Is brown noise, would that be like in a game of magic where you have your deck and you know what the 60 cards are in your deck and as you've drawn through 10 cards of your deck and you haven't drawn the card you want, there's four copies of that card in your deck, your prior draws, having not hit it, has increased your chance of hitting it because the deck is smaller and the same number of copies are in there? Is that, that considered brown noise? It could be. These are, these are like generic terms, um, and that could be a version of it. Obviously, the more you draw, like the 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 more you kind of hone in on what you know you're going to get in the future. Uh, so I would say that's like a, a brown noise that becomes more brown noise the later in the game you get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it reduces the variance over over the course of the game. Yeah, your drawing of your initial seven cards is more of a white noise because there's no influence exactly what's in the okay I, I love this i know i love it too <laughs> and the last one which i think is the most satisfying and you'll probably agree with pink noise it's interesting actually pink noise is, a, is an interesting concept because if you play brown noise white noise pink noise to a group of 100 people just like the noise people generally prefer pink noise the most um not, not like not like it's musical or anything but it's just the most pleasing sounding but what pink noise is this pink noise is there's there's low variance most of the time but every once in a while, there is huge variance. And every every once in a once in a while, there's even bigger variance. And a great example of this is like exploding sixes on dice. Uh, like I'm, I'm rolling D6 and whatever happens, whatever. If I roll a six, though, something crazy happens, you know? Mm -hmm. So that that's pink noise. And, and, and a lot of art in general is can, can be categorized by by pink noise. Even even human speaking is is pink noise. And let me see if I can explain how this works. So in art. If you were to look at a model you painted and you were to like to look at every single pixel of that color, most pixels surrounding each other are a similar color, right? They don't transition very quickly. Yeah. But every once in a while, they'll go from white to like a very dark color. And that, that represents the edge of a detail, right? Mm -hmm. And so even art is kind of organized in this pleasant way. But kind of kind of knowing that ahead of time, it's like, that's cool. I can like try to design some version of pink noise into my game or some some version of input randomness into my game because those just sound more appealing to me as a game player and so it's helpful for me to define these things kind of put them out in the open so i can use them as as tools instead of like kind of randomly using them because i know them from a different game yeah so pink noise which is also much much more uh pleasing than pink eye that's true <laughs> um is that i mean that totally makes sense for any kind of uh, a, a game 
at all of having these giant peaks of excitement, mm -hmm. right? But you can't have them all the time because then they're not peaks of excitement anymore. They're the norm. Yeah. Right? So you have to have those, like... You know, it's like, oh, but if I do get a, but if I do roll a natural nine plus on this charge, whoa, these guys weren't supposed to get in. And I know. It's, oh, crazy things happen. It's, it's risk versus reward management, and it's yeah. very satisfying. And it also allows, it gives your players hope, which is very important too. Like, you never want to feel like you have no agency and like there's nothing left for you to do in the game. But those kinds of events give you strategies, they give you comeback mechanics that are very important for like encouraging like players emotions um but yeah i've been reading a ton of shit and i'd love to make a habit of this just sharing one thing like i learned that sounded interesting whether it's math or psychology or or, or, or sociology related to uh gaming maybe one's a podcast okay yeah scott's gaming corner yeah something like that yeah we'll add a, we'll put a little separate set over there and then we'll just play the boop, 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 boop. Uh, like wear some like boop, tweed jacket boop, and some boop. shit it's like that what's that from the muppets where there's like they they play that and the guy or was it from sesame street they play that song and then there's just like a the the guest host sits down and it looks like in this old timey really fancy library <laughs> and they read from a book uh, pro i'm probably the only person that remembers that so. <laughs> If you if you remember that from either Muppets or Sesame Street, I can't remember what it's from. Uh, let me know down in the comments section. <laughs> yeah. but uh, I want I want to credit the person who taught me that. That was from um, Jeff Engelstein. He uh, has the Game Tech Corner on the podcast known as The Tower. He wrote a book called Game Tech, which are all of those segments from the previous episodes of The Tower put together in written form. And that's where I learned that. So if you want to check it out, I think he has a video on it, too. His name is Jeff, G-E-O-F-F, -F, that kind of Jeff. Uh, Engel, Yikes. Engelstein. He's like, he's, a, he's like a mathematician, and he loves playing games. And so the, the, together is a really interesting combo. Yes. Well, that seems like that combo transitions to a new combo, and that's a combo of things that we painted. Hey, let's do it. What'd you paint? Um, so I painted up these little Gloomhaven minis, and I painted five of them in just under four hours. So I was like, how, how am I going to paint models quickly for a, a new board game or for a new box game that I want to get and play and trying a new approach to it? So what I did was I primed them all black, and then I did a two-tone contrast paint or speed paint or whatever other Vallejo one they're called uh, is the first thing, directly over black primer. And obviously those kinds of paints, contrast paints over black, don't show up really well. So the bottom half of the model I painted in like a purple and the top half of the model I paint in like a green. And then I kind of just swashed it together where the two colors hit and to create this a little bit of a blurring, a blending. Again, the point is to do that step really fast. And what that does is it allows me to create some color interest in the shadows so there's never any pure black anywhere across the model, but it's still very dark because you're doing this contrast step directly over black primer. And then I just used my brush almost like it was a pencil. And everywhere I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm either going to draw lines or I'm going to leave it plus or it's going to be ones and zeros there's either lines or there's nothing but because we have that color interest in the shadows it doesn't look so stark and the areas that didn't get paint didn't get layers um didn't feel so like unfinished um the other thing is it allows me to paint an entire model and never have to base coat an entire surface because when you think about what takes the most time it's Okay, I got to paint this entire tunic brown. So I got to make sure I hit every section of it with a base coat of brown, hit all the parts of the shoulder, got to avoid the the satchels, I got to avoid the belts and the shoulder straps and paint this all in brown. I never did that. I just try to hit the vast majority of the surface if I wanted the whole thing green, or I just tried to hit the lines if I wanted that thing green. And then I spent that time that I saved by not having to base coat everything fully by pushing up select highlights on certain materials or certain areas of focus of the model. So I would do certain areas, I'd do two, three highlights. In certain areas, I either didn't even base coat at all or just did a single base coat of a certain color. And it allowed me to paint them all quickly um, to have a level of interest in strikingness at a tabletop level, but do it um, where I was actually feeling like I was making progress. And it also is teaching me while I'm painting models for a game really fast it's teaching me what's the important things to paint in a model and that translates 
in a model you're painting in 30 minutes up to a model you're painting in 30 hours. It yeah. all translates. Yeah. Just how much time and effort you're putting in. Right. Because every every model, whether you think it or not, is capped by time. And that's either because of an event you're trying to attend or because it's limited by your your patience. And so it's still good to know, even if you're painting a model for 100 hours, like where is the most value going to come from if I invest 60 hours of my time, 40 hours? Like what am I going to paint the most? So it's still very valuable to know that. What's your favorite one? Um, I think the knight here. The knight? My favorite is the green guy. I think he is the, like that, the technique you mentioned about using a base coat that also is a layer, but you're applying opaquely like really worked well with that green hood like it made it stand out in the in the blue or purplish shadow complemented that green very nicely yeah i think so i think um by and large uh, this this lady with the spear and stuff her face is is kind of chuffed i guess would be the to the term where her face sculpt was a little bit to be desired so putting a lot of attention on that kind of like accentuated her derpiness a little bit yeah yeah a little bit um but besides that I think it all, it, you know, I was I was pretty happy. I was like, oh, man, I could just, all the heroes for a new box game I'm playing are just the the enemies that we, and we for the first couple of adventures, we just seems like we're facing all the orcs. I could sit down in an afternoon. I could paint everything we'd play for the game that weekend. And then, oh, it looks like the next adventures, we're going to be fighting some zombies and stuff instead. Boom. And in one evening, I could knock out all those in this style. And to me, the most important thing and kind of the premise of the video was, um, Speed painting kind of by necessity is typically done in a way that sucks the fun out of the painting. And so what I wanted to do was come up with a way to paint things quickly that still attaches enough of the fun parts of painting, to me at least, um, that keeps those intact. Okay. So I spent four hours painting these and I had fun the whole time. It was maybe not the most fun I've ever had painting miniatures, but there was a level of fun that never dropped off because I never felt like I was batch painting things to oblivion. I never felt like there was this step that is mindless and boring. I always was engaged because I'm like, okay, where am I going to put the the base coat here? You know, is it it's closer to the head and shoulders? I'll put more up there. I'll put less down there. But I was never stuck in the minutia of taking hours to complete this one step for a blend or for a you know attention focus or whatever and it was always working with layer consistency paint so i was always seeing the impact that i was making in real time and, and that felt good yeah so that was kind of the approach and i is this format refined to the level of like i think this is the best version of painting in the style maybe not probably not but i think it's it's a lot closer to a speed painting system that i enjoy and i'm fairly happy with the output that i've probably ever done nice that's awesome yeah i, I speed painting is such an enjoyable thing to do um i really look back kind of the the time when i streamed at 5 a.m and i had like a i don't know how long of a period it was but i was like painting models from the others a simon game and i would paint them one a stream so i paint one model in two hours so not as fast as you're going here um, but it was still very satisfying to like sit down and know by the end of the stream that i'm going to have a model that looks kind of decent. Mm -hmm. I had done a couple in the past and I knew that I could do it in that time frame and it was like, okay. And so this was a really, it was a really encouraging thing and it like really helps to, uh, occasionally, I haven't done it in a while, like mix that into the, the painting process. Yeah, I think there's a healthy level of switching up For the sure. amount of time or even the techniques you use or whatever in your painting because it reminds you that there's all sorts of other things that can be successful and that you can get that um, the dopamine of finishing a thing in different amounts of time. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. The other thing that I did was is not painting and I just finished it last night. It's not a hundred percent done with the base is I, I took, uh, all the big Tyranid models out of the new Leviathan box. Mm -hmm. There's like three or four big Tyranid models. And I was like, star killer. It's like, you know what? Screamer killer. So, Streamer killer. Okay. Okay. My bad, it's my probably bad. a dumber name than star killer actually. But anyway, there's a bunch of them. And like every time they GW releases these big boxes within six months, there's like, you can buy that half of the box on eBay for 40 bucks or like everyone's trying to offload the other half of the box. They, don't they kind of it, like, yeah. they, they flood the market and something about them like loses the value, right? Like 
they're not as cool anymore because I remember specifically with the Death Guard stuff when that box came out, Dark Imperium, mm -hmm. I think it was called. Oh, yeah. And yeah, there was yeah. just like Death Guard everywhere and they just like lost their luster because you'd saw, see them all the time and you'd do all these things with them. And it was just like, even though the models were cool, they just seemed less cool over time. So I'm like, I'm just going to take all of these, the big models in there. And I'm going to cut them the fuck up and I'm going to make one massive Tyranid. Big bug. Yeah. And so I'm just like, I want to make something that doesn't look like any of these things in here to kind of show people that like you can take these cool things that you'll be able to get on the cheap later or you just like, I don't need four screamer killers or whatever. What if I just make some big nasty thing and it end up looking like a giant ant because it had this big thorax, a big abdomen, and this big head, and it's got all these legs and it's like I I put it at you can go a lot more um like uh, I'll see if I can just show you a picture I'll, I'll send this to Alex but um because I didn't bring it because it's one it's massive and, <laughs> and two um, how big is the gesture for the video of you um it's the base the only base that I owned that I could fit it on luckily I had one from Cobalt Keep is 180 oh god so there's there's two pictures. There's a front view and a side view if you scroll. But it's uh, it's it's massive. And you can work with, like, the terrain. Like, the other thing is when you kit bash something yourself, you can build in movement or pose that you can, like, build around the base for. So it's like, I want it to feel like it's, like, crawling over this environment. And not all the legs are static. And so it's, there's a lot of movement. And then I could have fun with um, – there's more work I still need to do on the base. But, like, create this – creepy almost like cavern environment that it's on yeah, and it's yeah. like crawling through with stalag I don't tights. yeah I don't know if it's stalag tights or stalag mites yeah, or whatever coming off of the ground and stuff and it's like big massive mama uh, a tyranid like um, so the only thing that I'm 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 bummed with is size, based on the size that I made it. I actually don't know what it would be accounts as because uh -huh. it's so big. You could probably use it. It's not as big as the. Um, I looked up the Forge World one. They have the Bio Titan. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh man, this thing's fucking big. Maybe it's big enough for a Bio Titan. A Bio Titan is eleven inches. <laughs> But this isn't that much smaller. But it's a baby biotype. Yeah, it's just it's just a baby. Yeah. So I just I kept bash that oh, thing and I hacked up a bunch of shit. Why are you concerned about what it counts as? I, I, maybe. So I think you said this last time. Are, are you actually going to start a Tyranid army or something? Or I don't know. Probably okay. probably not. Okay. I just <laughs> cut up all my Tyranids. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I still have all the little boy the little boys. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, if I did a Tyranid army. I would kit bash so all the little the little boys with the with the guns had some kind of a bio weapon and not an actual gun because I think that's the stupidest fucking thing that they're they are the Zerg they have a hive mind and they're using fucking rifles like some well, I have, know they're bi I know they're bio guns and blah 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 yeah but they look like a fucking machine gun <laughs> it should be a big fucking cannon instead of an arm that's all gooey and, and it looks organic like they yeah. don't look organic so i'd have to like kit bash all of that and i feel like doing that on 80 termagants or whatever no, probably you. would kill me yeah, on the inside that's uh that's no bueno yeah no bueno indeed yeah i think modern synthetist a synthetist i can't say that word um who is an instagrammer all, but originally a blog writer, I found him uh, on Blogspot like I swear like a decade ago. He has the same critique that you do in some ways that the weapons just seem too separate from the body to be anything mm -hmm. like biological. And so he often adds more tubes and more like sinews and flesh connecting the weapon to the yeah. the main alien. Yeah, maybe that would be it. Maybe there's something I could put over the top. Let's just put like sprue goo over yeah, the or, rifle. Or like maybe like some uhu glue that's like kind of slimy. That can help. Maybe maybe a combination of those things for sure. The other thing I don't get about Tyranids is some of the ones like the big ones with forearms, they got a gun, but they also have a big sword. And I'm like, we're talking about Sometimes it's the exact same model, also has arms, with a giant, like, scythe arm like they're a fucking praying mantis. Why does it need to hold a sword? It's got fucking sword arms built in. <laughs> you holding a sword is the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard of. It's like, no, these are, they're on, like, massive evolution over time to be destroyers of all biomass. I did look on the fucking Wikipedia for Tyranids while making this video, okay? So, <laughs> you feel guilty about that? No, I'm I'm sorry. I'm doing a little bit. Of, I'm doing a little bit of research here. Why would they have a sword? Where are they getting these fucking swords first of all? And why would they have a sword when they are like 
biologically designed to have all the things they need to just come out of the fucking egg sack and eat your planet. Like, why would they need uh, extra shit? What if they give birth to the swords? I mean, Bio that, swords. That, dude, that is totally something that bullshit Warhammer lore would do. What if the sword is an alien itself? <laughs> oh, alien sword. It needs like a single eyeball on the side of yeah. it, like fucking Soul Calibur. Like you were born to be a thing that other aliens use to hit people with. Yeah, it's like alive and it talks and has its own thoughts and feelings. Ah, fuck no, nah, yeah, yeah, maybe. His name is just Charles Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is my sword. Hey, Jeff, what are we having for supper tonight? <laughs> I want Chipotle. <laughs> fuck you, Jeff. You're going back in the sheath. That was, that was John reenacting uh, moments for us recording the podcast, asking me where I wanted to eat. I'm Jeff the Sword. You're Jeff the Sword that, <laughs> that chooses Chipotle, and I put you back in the sheath. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what did I paint? I painted uh, a portion of Neferata's Dread Abyssal. Uh, one new thing I tried out was I washed all those skulls that I did previously with uh, uh, cadmium oil red wash because uh, I wanted it to be kind of glowy. Normally, people with a wash, they'll they'll think about using a dark color, which makes a lot of sense. You know, shadows typically happen in, in the recesses, but these skulls were painted with a decent like white to kind of... Uh, fluorescent pink red uh, highlight and so I wanted to make them kind of like glowing and I, I went for a super thin down uh, oil wash with a, a brand called Sennelier and it, it was great it didn't break, it was very fancy it didn't break down at all um, and it cleaned up really nicely and I honestly I fucking love the effect um, I thought it was really cool and I can't wait to try it again the one learning lesson that I had was that I did get it on some of the black bone and when it dried, the red really showed up. And so I had to like go through and clean off all the black bone because it's so black and it's so different than the red that it shows up in a huge way. And so I had to kind of kind of just make sure I wasn't getting it all over the place because it was kind of a pain in the ass to like clean Like some up. spots where it comes up between the bones, like in the cracks yes. on this vertebrae. So it's fucking great. I know. Yeah, it was so cool and it was so easy to do. This stuff is so vibrant too. Oh, it's, yeah. It's like legit cadmium red. Um, how much of it did you eat? <laughs> Luckily, none of it. Oh. Um, but I have a couple of things left on uh, the, the model. Obviously, the base, the, the gold details are just base coated. The gems are on the front of the model. Um, I need to. I don't know if I'm going to paint the ghosts anymore. They seem kind of fine, honestly. Uh, I'm trying to find the perfect black recipe, and we're going to talk more about the experiments that I did to try to achieve that on this bone. I want a quick black recipe, not not just like black in general. And I want to talk about the things that I tried. And the things that failed in the uh, after party, um, but I didn't want to spend a lot of time on the black bone. Um, but I wanted to look kind of you know good from five feet away. Um, and some things I tried harder on. Th some things I kind of just let you know kind of just lie and just be dark. Um, but uh, I don't know. What do you think about the black? This model makes me feel like I've got like the palsy or something because it's so boingy. I feel the like, palsy. <laughs> like I'm just like feel like I'm a shaking mess holding it because it just wants to bounce. Yeah, dude, that's that boing factor. Yeah, dude. yeah. No, I, th I. I like it because it's what you've done with the black is subdued. And there's a couple parts where you've, you've put a little bit more lines, a little bit brighter highlights that I think it tells you that, that the, the highlights and stuff are there and it, and it defines the shapes without it getting so far away from black. Yeah. That's always the toughest thing. Yeah. Is yeah. That, that is the toughest thing. So, that, so it's like, how do you do black fast? So it's like you can dry brush it and then you can wash it and you can like do all these different ideas. And so I've tried a couple of different things on that model. Some total waste of time, some failures, some successes, but I have other ideas for strategies that I'm looking forward to in the future. I found that washing a paint, whether you're washing a dark gray or whatever, to try to make a black, I've never felt that that's worked well. It ha Yeah, I I I've struggled as well. It's like it almost, the thing is with black, it's like any, for any color, you need a, a certain percentage of that surface to read as that color. Um, otherwise, it reads as a different color. So... <laughs> If you paint something dark gray and then you wash it in black, one of two things is going to happen. One, it's going to act like a wash it act, and then the surface reads as dark gray with shadows. Mm -hmm. Or the wash is very thick or very potent, and then the whole thing reads as black, and then the wash step was pointless. Yeah, yeah. So I just found that that washing for most black surfaces 
especially when you're you know not trying to put in 50 hours to make this black templar for golden demon right yeah that you you really it's more about defining the highlights and one thing that games workshop does that i think often works really well is one they spend a ton of time doing edge highlighting but on the little little corners and little edges they go fairly bright but they're just very restrained in how often it's used yeah whenever two corners meet they often punch that up a little bit more as well yeah. and it can even like looking at the recipes like looking at infernal brushes website Mm -hmm. it's for the official gw recipes and seeing how they painted stuff in black um they get a pretty freaking dark pretty bright i should say in those little corners they do yeah yeah so that would be probably the only thing when when i'd say when you're looking at this is like is there a way you could just even like on the little vertebrae the spine things mm -hmm. like just touch the the corner yeah of each of those with almost like a yeah definitely like an Eschen Gray even, and I'm speaking in GW paint colors. Eschen Gray, I think, is a little bit too dark probably. But, um, yeah, like a, a light, like Uthuan, Uthuan, Uthuan Gray? Uthuan, Uthuan, Uth, yeah, that one. That one, yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty light. But like a tiny little dot. Yeah, I, I know I know what you mean. Yeah, I think I think that's definitely a good idea. Yeah. Hopefully I'm going to finish that thing on the next stream. Uh, I don't have a ton left. Just deal with the gold, deal with the throne. The little blood gems and then the base obviously and then the, the fucking one other arm fell off last stream i don't know why um, they they don't have a really nice connection point i've no. lost an arm on these things more times than <laughs> yeah. I know. but but the cool thing is when that model is done then i'm going to work on a video that wraps up my escalation league because i just played the 2k point game of my escalation league the last one fucking one baby 2k wiener Woo! uh and i want to wrap it up and so i want to paint the last unit that i need for my 2k list and that's a unit of 20 gg 20 grave guard gg baby so i'm gonna paint that gg and then we're gonna show off the full 2k soul blight list so fucking excited just have that finally check that off uh ever since we uh did that video where we painted that army to three years ago i'm i'm, I'm ringing it in baby you got Finish it it's strong finishing. hey <laughs> It's not about how long it took you to run the marathon. It's just yeah. that you finished it. Exactly. <laughs> so that's done. Uh, and then I painted the ranger's face for a fourth time because, one, I, I started. I did it in the video for the course, and it looked like shit. Well, I, I was like kind of like 30 minutes in, and it looked like shit, and I gave up. And that's part of the video, actually. Mm. The second one I filmed, I blocked like 90% of the footage with my fucking head. Uh, ah! and, and that that was the box art one. Uh, and then the third one I painted during the launch of the Kickstarter campaign and I made more of like a winter elf. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and then this fourth one is a repaint. So I actually have crystal clear footage of painting the face. And this one, I really went for this like kind of like sickly pale, like this guy stays up at all hours of the night, like watching people kind of scout ranger vibe. Creepy. I know. Like he's a, he, he's a creep, you know, there's a reason why he's holding the guy's head and it isn't the other way around because he has the most Intel and is the most prepared. You know, he is the ranger after all. Like I said, so I went really heavy on the, like the purple bags under his eyes. The skin is, is pretty anemic looking. I used sandalwood from uh, scale. Oh. I, I love sandalwood from scale 75 for skin tones. It's a nice color. It's a nice color. It, it has a lot. It lacks a lot of yellow. There's, there's very little yellow in it. It's a lot of just kind of pink uh, color. And, and when you kind of highlight up with white and a little bit of Vallejo ice yellow, it gives you this kind of sickly look. Um, and it's, so I, I like definitely it. looks really good. Thank it's you. Super clean and crisp. And, Here's here's the thing that I really appreciate about this that it looks so good and it's so hard to do is you have dark lines on here mm -hmm. that still feel like a human's face. It still looks like when I look at this, that looks like what a, a person's face would look like. Thank you. And they're thin and they really, really work to define all the musculature and the, the really good sculpt of this face. He's got kind of a lumpy face, like, yeah. which is not, not a critique, but there are a lot of volumes going on on that model's face. And so, like, like you said, if you define them too harshly with too thick a line, too dark a line, that guy's face can look really bad. <laughs> right. So you need to do it with a certain degree of subtlety that I have had to learn over the course of painting that face a couple times. Um, it's a challenge, but it's a, it's a fun challenge. You know, I, I continue to love painting faces. But um, but not shying away from yes. making that a, a 
stark jump. Yes. And it's also a lot of like playing don't pee on the electric fence too because like <laughs> you can't like you got to keep when and you every time you're doing another layer of paint you have to avoid that fucking yeah, crap. Yeah. Or sometimes you don't. Like if you want to make it more subtle, I will intentionally paint over recesses with a diluted version of my midtone and that'll mm -hmm. soften it a little bit, mm -hmm. but it'll still keep it dark enough that when compared to my max highlights, it's pretty fucking it's pretty fucking uh dark. Yeah, I can I can see it in spots like in the shapes under the cheekbones and stuff. Yeah, yeah. You just glazed over there with the midtone so it's yeah. like a little bit. A little bit, yeah. You know, it's it's like like I said always say, painting is definitely diagnostic. You try a thing, you look at it, if it's not and if it's too dark, and then you try it again. If it's oh, oh fuck, I, I ran over it. Paint it back in. So it's it's a lot of that, you know. A little backy forthy. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. It's um in when we were talking about uh, earlier, we were talking about the on the Facebook Trapped in a Plastic Facebook group we were, there's a uh post out there talking about the World of Warcraft hardcore server that Blizzard is opening. Mm -hmm. And uh someone made a comment on there. That they're like, oh, what if we had a mini painting version of this or of hardcore mini painting where if you ever screw up, like you're done, like you have to stop. <laughs> How and does that work? Who defines messing up? Yeah. Which I'm like, it's, it was meant kind of in jest. Which yeah, is like, sure. But which is good. But it actually got me thinking. It was just like, you know, thinking that screwing up or making a mistake is anything but part of the painting process is, is, in my opinion, the incorrect way to go about it because no painter, the best painters that have ever lived or are probably alive today that paint miniatures, and probably this goes with all forms of, of painting, it is an example of seeing how a thing turned out and not liking that thing and then adapting and trying again. And so worrying about not making mistakes is... is something you shouldn't give yourself the stress with yeah it's, too, it's counterintuitive yeah they're, go, they're gonna happen it's about how do you like, how do you do that exception handling how do you solve those errors when they arrive yeah and what if this mistake in quotes is just you applied the paint you did the technique you did all the things perfectly and it just didn't work from a color perspective or from a highlight where you decided to change something that's not necessarily a mistake so it, it's just you learning, adapting, and figuring out how you want to redo something or alter it in a way that you think will work better. And so looking at everything you do under that lens of you just analyzing and then move forward is a much healthier way than looking at things in a being hard on yourself. For sure. So it all, I mean, it just sucks the joy out of the hobby as well, you know? Yeah. So along with uh, Scott's uh, book corner, we now have... Uh, John's it's all going to be okay corner it's all going to be okay it's all going to be okay just let me make you feel good so we don't have a sponsor today because everyone is dumb and they won't let they won't sponsor us but you know maybe they're listening now and, and they'll want to sponsor us in the we future we just call them dumb you know yeah because like let's be like listen you know sometimes we come across people in our lives that are just like oh man you just dumb but what if what if you could be a dumb person and like all you'd have to do is like pay a little bit of money and get free and get some advertising out of it. And then you're not dumb anymore. I think everyone would do that in their real life. <laughs> yeah. So why don't businesses do that with sponsoring trapped under plastic? I don't know, but they should. Yeah. But in lieu of that, we will advertise our own shit. If you like this podcast and you want to support it, check out our Patreon. We do an extended episode of the podcast where we talk about extra bits, like new things we've learned in the hobby and failed at. Talk about models that we love from other painters. And we also chat about, hmm. We critique we one critique of our patrons. One of our patrons. That is right. And so as a patron, you can submit a topic for us to discuss, um, which I believe is actually uh, this episode's topic. Uh, and also, you can submit models for us to get feedback on. Two options for you there. Um. All right. We're going to get on to the main topic of today. And the main topic of today would be magazines. <laughs> magazines. Because <laughs> it's 1998 all over again. So, if Scott, if there was a miniature hobby physical magazine, um, what would that look like in our ideal world? Like, if you had a magazine subscription, because look, everyone likes getting stuff 
in the mail. Like this is the day and age of Amazon where you get to give mm. yourself presents wow. by ordering things and getting them in the mail. But if you had a monthly subscription to this physical thing that you look forward to every month, you got to open the pages, it's beautiful artwork, it's this nice glossy thing, and then you could put it on your shelf and, and just kind of look at your nice collection of a, a mini painting magazine. What would that look like? What would be inside the inside the covers? And that's this is a great question uh, that came to us by one of our patrons. Uh, do, do you know who the name of the patron is? I do not, but we'll put the name on the screen right now. Oh, we'll find it. Um, so a little history on this, and we were looking at topics, and this one resonated with me for a couple of reasons. One, I'm old. So when I was a kid, um, I had magazine subscriptions so i had magazine subscriptions for magic the gathering of course so i had inquest magazine i had scry magazine i also had even before that when i was even younger probably like six seven eight years old i got uh video game magazines mm -hmm. so i had game they pro they would teach you the fucking like the best way to get through some single player campaign or the cheat codes for them or shit like that. You remember buying books that would like talk about like where all the secrets were? In video yeah, games? dude. Like you'd go to the bookstore, the yeah, video game yeah. section. Yeah, and, and yeah. These yeah. thick ass books of just like, oh, you want to beat Simon's Quest 2, do ya? <laughs> um, so, so I, I, I'd look back in this with nostalgia very fondly of those things. I also, when I got to, you know, 12, 13 years old, I'd started buying. Dragon Magazine and Dungeon Magazine, which were two different Dungeons and Dragons um, magazines. Oh, I thought Dragon Magazine was just like a, a picture of a bunch of dragons. <laughs> just dragons. Yeah. Yeah. So Dungeon Magazine was the magazine for Dungeon Masters, and it focused on that side of D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. And Dragon Magazine was a magazine kind of for everyone, whether you were a player or a DM. Okay. And so between those three genres, I have this catalog of things that I really liked um, in terms of content within a magazine, as well as later on when I got, when I first was going to get into miniature painting but never actually painted anything, I picked up those Conquest magazines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah. So you know those. So those yeah, you like, lent that to me, yeah. So between that, I was never a white dwarf person. I wasn't a kid playing Warhammer, so I, I wasn't even aware that that was a thing. So mm -hmm. you're probably going to have to help for that with that side. But... Um, there were some things in the Conquest magazine that really resonated with me at the time. And then going back and looking at them now, when I paint a lot, I see areas, parts of that magazine that I really still think hold up, but could very much be improved. Yeah. Yeah. So, so my, my, my thousand foot take on magazines is that I, I see them as a competitor, not in an aggressive way. But I, I think that magazines in many ways were the YouTube channels of the early 2000s and yeah. late 90s for our hobby at the very least. Because like, like John said, I was I was huge into White Dwarf. I have a ton of editions of that. Uh, I, I even got into GW for a little bit, did this thing called Warhammer Visions, which was I fucking love this idea. And it, it's all art focused stuff like it, it's not about gaming. It's not about like anything terrain related or nothing. It's just like, we're going to show you pictures of pretty models, maybe some painting guys and that's it. And it's just like full play, full two page bleeds of just beautiful miniature photography. Um, and that, that, they did that for like one season. So a, a full year. So 12 magazines, one, one a month. Um, and that was awesome. Cool. So, so, but yeah, so I, I kind of see them as a way to convey hobby information, in, but in written format. And so I've always, uh, I don't think they're a competitor necessarily, but I've always compared the two and I've always been curious and why I would love to talk about this in the podcast is, is what does the written format bring to the educational experience that a video format doesn't? And like, where, where do like magazines and books find their value compared to YouTube videos, you know, YouTube, uh, TikTok shorts, all that kind of shit. Um, and so I don't necessarily know the answer to that question. I have a couple ideas. That's that's why I'm jazzed to chat about this because that's, that's kind of how I've always thought about magazines, articles, etc. Oh, I got I got a little bit of a hot take on this too. Okay, I um from the start of me making painting videos and being inspired by people that were making miniature painting videos, you being one of the main ones, was to see was noticing that making miniature painting focused or hobby focused videos 
that could not be done in a written visual format was very appealing to me because at the time, and even to this day, I think there are a lot of uh, YouTube tutorials and videos and that kind of stuff, and I'll look directly down the barrel of the gun and point it at Games Workshop official painting videos. It's you could have done this could have been an article with yeah, pictures. Yeah, how much of the process they really describe and show is so minimal. It's like I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do in the next thirty seconds of this like footage, but you're not going to see it. Um, you're going to see like two brush strokes, bang, and end result. Yeah. You know, that's a picture. That's a picture exactly. Yeah, and so it, it's to me it can it can live and not compete because it can do a thing that is actually more valuable to have in print to double check the 50 50 mix of this plus this okay and then apply it like over all of the edges of this that can be in writing and there's more value to me to go back and reference the written description as opposed to re-scrubbing this 30 seconds of the video where they show it really quickly they put the paints on the screen really quickly and they just get to doing the thing in a very like matter of fact step-by-step -step way Having something with pictures and and text is more valuable than in an eight minute video where it all just runs by. Now, granted, if you want to look at that from a entertainment value, the video is more entertaining. But in actually taking away and doing in this very matter of fact, one hundred percent education, zero percent entertainment, which is that's GW's painting videos. Um, that I think of printed physical medium is as good or better yeah so you can you can if you had a magazine where it was a let's say a monthly magazine and in every every magazine there was one really nice painting tutorial in pdf style right where nice big pictures maybe like uh, or just like three smaller ones of showing the like different brush strokes and examples of like here's how you're pulling your brush into the corners mm -hmm. and here's how you're holding your brush uh, to hit the edge what the angle of the brush is and you can get the nice camera angles of just exactly how you're wanting to show it and going through step by step of here's the color mixes here's how it looked after each of these steps so you can compare as you're doing yours and having this nice six eight page spread of here's you finishing an entire xyz model right yeah. that like that's that's in every issue man that's so good because when i looked at the confrontation ones that was like my jumping off point of feeling like i didn't need to know anything i didn't need to stare at it at the screen for an eight minute video and absorb it so i when i go back to do it it, it i didn't lose it all in the ether those confrontation magazines the the actual text associated with them were so fucking bad. Yeah. And they were so under described. Right. It was like the editor was making them like it <laughs> felt like they were like just given not enough room. And it, it was like you got a hundred really, words. <laughs> yeah. I really don't know what this step is because you said it in two sentences and it was a, a really important part because the next picture it looks fucking awesome, but I can't really tell. So like being able to really give them the time and having the correct editing to make it very succinct, succinct, easy to follow the the fewest amount of words to be able to say the thing in a way that someone can translate to their to their own, which is not an easy thing to do. No. And in some cases, having constraints on a creative process is very helpful because it makes you think outside of the box. So it's like yeah. you have 200 words to describe something that you would generally use 700 for. Like, what's the most important things you need to say? And that's good. But you, you're touching on something that I think uh, written content really has way better than video content. And that's reference material. Yeah. It's like if you are sitting down at your desk, it is way easier to leaf through a book or a PDF, find exactly what you need, keep it on that page, and just keep peering back at it, whether it's the written content or the visual content with a video. I mean, have you ever tried to make a recipe from a YouTube video? Like food, it fucking sucks. Yeah, it does. You're in the kitchen. You're like, like leafing through this 10 minute video, trying to find that one spot where the guy describes how, like how much salt is supposed to be in this part of the recipe. And it's like, man, if that was just written somewhere, like so much easier. And so for a lot of reasons, 
uh, similar to a painting, you want to find that quick info. And so having it written down next to you, either physically or digitally, that's the other thing is that you can take a book anywhere. You can't always take a computer or a phone anywhere, or you don't prefer to take a phone anywhere. Uh, you don't want next to you while you're painting. You want that kind of break from social media and stuff like that. Right. And so, yeah, writ- written content, that, 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 that's the first thing I always think of is, is that that main thing as being uh, a, a value over it. And so, so asking the question, what should be in uh, magazines, considering that answer, it should be stuff that is very concrete and is very definable and is very, very valuable to reference like quickly. Like that, that's the kind of stuff that I want to see in a magazine. That's where I find my value in, in written content. Yeah. And I, I think the differentiator here, because this is one of the big sections that I think the value of this magazine would be as opposed to there's like there's some big books out there now in miniature painting, right? So different people have come out with books and like AK Interactive comes out with books and there's some other companies that come out with books. They're like big tomes of miniature painting and everything. And those are, those do a lot of those things, maybe to better or worse extents of the execution of them. But they're also a massive commitment in an undertaking of opening the cover of that book. If you had a magazine that I just knew there's there's step by step of one mini in here and also in each uh, each issue there is one uh quick tip step by step of like this is not pinning a whole model. Here's how you make good looking leather and you know in two pages or whatever. And so it it's digestible, mm-hmm. right? It is not an entire 400 page cookbook. It is one really awesome recipe that's within the pages that we think you should try with some beautiful pictures of it. And, you know, on any cool autumn morning, you know that you're going to want to start making your potato soup. Here's the best (laughs) cheesy potato soup. I'm like, fuck, yes, I want this. But if I had 400 pages, I'm leaving through. I didn't even know I want potato soup. It's, It's buried in there somewhere. Yeah. But, dude, who doesn't want? cheesy potato soup on a fucking autumn day that is bro everybody that's, does that's a bit of me right there god damn a little bit of bacon in there too <laughs> oh, a, little no, bit of, a little bit of chive you know, Ooh, cream what? cream based nice yeah. black pepper hit oh. god damn let's get some soup for lunch <laughs> yeah so that is another thing that you just touched on that i think is a value of written content and i'm gonna try to describe a topic here that is a little bit in the sky but so when you are making a miniature painting video you you know what you're doing with your hands. You know you're filming it. You sit down to edit it. You know what you're trying to say. But sometimes it's really challenging to convey what you're trying to say because miniature painting really progresses in these slow micro transitions, right? Yes. And so it's like, it's like I'm going to tell you what I'm attempting to do and I'm going to show you it. And I don't always accomplish that perfectly. Uh, so with written content, they really care about the end step and so the 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 content is always formatted around that and so like beginning and end is like a huge consideration they have when writing that content when formatting it and so like i think written content one of the things i'm always looking for is like here's where we are here's where we want to get just like side by side like right there and then maybe some kind of like transitionary step in between so you can kind of see what it looks like in progress but like they really care about that before and after like that really satisfying reddit post it's like here's where i, I had this shitty toy and now it's beautifully painted uh but like <laughs> on like a on like an individual step basis right mm-hmm. and so that's that's very helpful i think for education's purpose because you're like i know what the end goal is supposed to look like and so i can i can shoot for that i always struggle when i'm making my videos to just be like very clear like this is my goal this is what it looks like like sometimes the lighting is off, the angle of the model is bad, like the camera is too low to the ground, it's not high up enough, like the background color is bad, the foreground color is bad, so it's like obscuring some detail you want. Like because that content is is static and photography based, like they that is a thing they care about and think about a lot. And so they always kind of nail the like this is what you're shooting for kind of vibe yeah does that make sense you have a lot more control over the variables to get the thing just the way you want it yeah doing stills and you can tell by looking through that viewfinder 
because you're not then just saying, well, now we're doing it live. Now you're recording. Right. Now you're painting that cloak. And if you fucked it up, whether by getting your head in the shot or by, <laughs> you know, not getting not the angle of the camera or whatever, at some point of the blending and the cloth is not exactly right, you still kind of got to use it. But yeah. when you have, you're able to stop. Yep. And show those stills. You can make sure every variable is right before you, you know, you click to take a picture. And th there's a lot of value in that. Um, that you, we, we almost get, I, at least I, it was kind of jealous of that they have that much control over that. That we, we, we try to hone our craft to get, get as much control as we can. And it's always right. the, the fight. It's always the battle and in, in, in striving to get better. Right. Because you, we can show pictures of stuff in videos, or 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 you know whatever slowly panning footage, but um, because that's a main focus of that kind of content, they're thinking about it, they're formatting their work to to accommodate it. It just it, it lends itself to that kind of thinking, and so it comes out better in that medium. Yeah, uh, that that doesn't say that like video makers can't learn from it and try to implement it. It just, it just is not as intrinsic to the process. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. So obviously a big, you know, a, 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 not a big, but a mainstay in each issue would have a painting of a model and then a showing of a technique. But this, we, we're not limiting ourselves to this because if that was just your magazine, I feel as a whole, it's not enough of a value to comparative to other forms of media that show you how to learn. Okay. There's some other things I'd really like to know about. In every magazine, I want to know a calendar of miniature focused, miniature hobby, miniature painting, miniature gaming um, events that are happening all around the world. Yeah, this is this is something that people constantly ask people for. It's like, does somebody, somebody have a list of all the mini painting competitions? It's like, yeah, you could totally do that in a magazine. Yeah, you could say, here's what's coming up, even for like the, this quarter or whatever, mm -hmm. or um it could be fun small local ones it can be you know it can be uh online ones competitions it can be a way just like oh there's a small there's a warhammer and like all you'd have to do was email in your events and, and blah 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 and then they could get published so people feel like they would know what's happening and in conjunction with that a big part and i like it's always a struggle and mr lee's minis is probably the closest we'd have to it but like what if there was a, a new new products or new minis coming out this month or this month plus next month or whatever of that are being released and so you'd show nice pictures of mm -hmm. these new mini these new minis by Chimera or Big Child or whomever or this upcoming Kickstarter here's some whatever so you get to see you always feel like if there's a new thing coming out, could be a new game that has minis in it, could be a new product line, it could be new paintbrush line, could be new minis themselves, could be weird new tchotchkes or whatever, that this section every month in the magazine, I feel like I have this one thing that I, I flip through every month, I feel like I'm in the know. And then in my back catalog, I'd be like, oh, there was this really sweet like skeleton minis that this company did, uh, I think that was like last August, and you go and you find it. Instead of having to like, what's the name of this company? What was the name of the model? And just like shoot shots in the dark on the internet. And like you just have this physical catalog of things that you can go back to and who is the company that made that and whatever. And it's like, because sometimes going through and seeing that visual, that'll sink into your memory. And then later on, you'd be like, oh yeah, there was a really cool one. I know that it'll exist in my yes. catalog of Goody PP magazine. Yes, and it's not hard to find or it's 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 way easier to find than it is to like parse through all of the content I thought I watched in the last week which is like, you know, Instagram Reels, YouTube videos, things on Twitter. It's like, yeah, it's it's way easier to find, especially when it's like kind of contained in that way. Yeah, so um, yeah. regular, you think that would is cool? Oh, like, for fucking sure, bud. Uh, another huge one for me is uh, YouTube channels typically are centralized around a personality. And so when the content doesn't show that personality, it doesn't do as well. And so uh, the kind of content that I fucking love that doesn't really exist on channels, at least in a formal way, are interviews. Uh, because interviews are all about some other person's opinion about something and it's all formatted around their answers. And it's because that content isn't very popular on YouTube at least in like the format of here's a person, I'm going to ask them questions and be a silent, uh, a silent uh, narrator. 
Um, Unless it's hot ones, and then it's very popular. So yeah, so <laughs> so Sean is on camera. He's asking there. People people like Sean. Um, that is definitely true. That's a good point. Uh, I didn't think about that. Uh, but but just, also, it's very it's very uh, popular celebrities that's true that definitely contributes but some kind of it's a fun twist yeah but like magazines as compared to youtube channels they're not centralized about around any one person like they're very we can do whatever we fucking want like you you are here you bought the subscription to this magazine just because you like the hobby it's not because you're associated with john you like who he is you think he has funny jokes a magazine is always a collection of a bunch of disparate writers where yeah. the focus is the topic, right? Yeah. And so it, it may, that format allows for uh, other types of content where it's just like an interview of a single person, say of, a, of an indie company or or like uh, or whatever, like the person who's looking into SioCast or whatever or implementing it in their business. And I, I, I like that kind of content. I like behind the scenes. Like I want to know what's going on at Corvus Belly, like how yeah. are they how are they transitioning into Siocast? Does it suck for them? What are their learning lessons? Like I would love to read that kind of industry interview kind of stuff. And we don't see a lot of that in our content at the moment. No. Yeah. And it's it's weird is the the deeper I feel like that we've gotten into this industry in terms of um, you know, obviously it's associated with what we do for a living. So we've either met people, uh, we've had kind of conversations with people that I would just be like, I think it would be awesome if more people knew about this, right? Just mm-hmm. the owner of Corvus Belly talking about a really interesting thing. Yeah. And granted, that's a kind of what we do on the podcast here is like we just have happenstance conversations of things that we've and let you guys know about things. But it would be nice if it would be more in a way where it's just like um, whether it's, you know, Roman Lapot breaking down like what his inspiration was for making these framed dioramas and mm-hmm. when and how he kind of goes about it and, and not a step by step how to complete it way, but like getting to know an, an interesting story related to our hobby, whether it be a company, whether it be an individual, whether it be an artist, whether it be a brand new painter, just these little kind of um, real life pieces mm-hmm. of, to and, and it helps feel like these companies that are not very big in the grand scheme of things that to gain more of a connection or have their personality be shown and also this magazine isn't sponsored by you know it's sponsored by army painter and so you feel like it's the army painter magazine i'm just using them no shade against army painter that like there's a there's a twist to it right they're, it's like, well, of course, they're going to talk about like, oh, the the reason why Speed Paint 2.0 is so awesome was, well, it's Army Painter Magazine, like this level of trust in, you know, having uh, journalistic integrity comes into play. So being separated by that. Oh, okay. The ads are very delineated. Okay. That's yes. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also think in relation to that, I also would love like um, op-ed pieces. What's that? I don't know what that is. So that would be like an editorial, you writing into a magazine where you could say like, is anyone else, what's the deal? You know, what's the deal with these paints? Like, is anyone else feeling like no one makes good real skin tone colors that are actually uh, a nice range of a wide variety of skin tones in the world what's the deal like people can write in really interesting things their take on something their opinion op-ed is opinion editorial and this is a this is a person who is a writer or it's just some random uh reader you mean random reader okay you okay. still got to meet the bar of like, of course of, of everything but like it would be interesting if there was like one or, or they're typically not super long but just like breaking down of like hey you know to feel like if I read someone's frustrations with this part or or their really excitement of interesting story of them getting back in the hobby and what really resonated with them in 500 words, like sometimes that's just kind of really fun and, and rewarding too, right? Or someone's recap of a Warhammer Age of Sigmar tournament they went to and had this amazing experience with meeting a new person wow. and that kind of thing. That would be, and that that happens already in articles now. But like a breakdown of like a tournament and like what factions performed well, and some kind of like article on like you know like the current state of the meta and balance. That's definitely things that happens now in videos. But like I would love to see all those charts and graphs like in written content and stuff like that. Like that'd be that'd be so cool. You can certainly even have that in there in a way that is uh, succinct and really like 
crisply defined that it's kind of at a glance stuff because I I think there's so many people and I think the medium of, of going through that stuff with uh, up-to-date articles and great YouTube breakdown and stuff does a really good job of that. Mm. Um, but having the, like, it's the, the temperature check, right? And so there's, like, a page of temperature check of a couple of different games. It's like, boom, here's a graph on this. Here's what the graph was compared to over the last 12 months or blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. Um, here's some bullet points of notes of what had changed, what new army came out, what new book came out, what what can you assess from this? And, you know, uh, here's a little bit on, like, the shooting meta is, is continuing to strive mm-hmm. and, and blah, 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 like a breakdown of that, but not a deep dive. So yeah. you're not trying to do the things that are, other forms of media are doing well, but you can always feel like yeah. oh, I can just dip my toe in and kind of understand where the state of the game is at right now. Yeah. Okay. You just made me think of something. Um, Cause you were like, you mentioned not trying to do things that other media is doing. And I, I respect that. I respect the hell out of anything, any creative who's like this thing that I want to create is happening elsewhere. And it's, it's fine. It works well. I don't need to remake it. I, I, I appreciate the hell out of that. But that being said, there is a, a magazine format that I've always appreciated that would be so amazing for the hobby if it existed. And I don't think it's really m- made for video. And that's uh, this idea of America's Test Kitchen. So when they make a recipe, they send the recipe to a list of chosen readers to test the recipe. <laughs> and they're like, how easy was this for you to do as a home cook? Like, were there ingredients that were hard to find in your grocery stores? Were there steps that were difficult to understand? And they get viewer feedback and they hone the recipe to make it actually executable for a person at home, but also still be like a solid fucking recipe. Like, like uh, America's Test Kitchen has amazing recipes and like the reasons why they do things and explain it is fantastic. But that's a different thing. But what if you had like a paint recipe that you did the same thing with? It's like, here's a recipe for this thing. Were, you, were finding it, was these steps easy? Were they clear? Was finding the paints easy enough? Like you could have like a list of readers that gave you nice feedback. Yeah. Did you have the tools? Do you feel like you can execute? Yeah. Were the ways that it was described? Did it, you feel confident? And did you it see enough? Out? You know, like that'd be so, and that'd be so valuable. Like, like no one has the time on YouTube with our turnarounds to really like sit down and do that. Like that would like add on a month, two months to like the production of a video just to do that. So totally not worth it. But like for a magazine where like you can plan out like additions like throughout the whole year and just send things to people. It's like okay, I, I, like painting this space marine is going to appear in this edition. I don't, I don't care exactly when the painting happens. It can happen like early in the year and come out midway through the year. It doesn't matter. Um, but that would be such a cool article to to read, just knowing someone's doing that work. Yeah, and then you feel like oh, uh, this is actually the third iteration of this Black Templar armor that yeah. we've asked people to do. Yeah. After your feedback, we feel like this one. We finally got there. And yeah. like your readers feel a part of that community that they help give their feedback. And then mm-hmm. by them being involved, they got the the best version um, or the the most um, reiterated version with multiple people's feedback. Because that's a big thing when we're explaining in a video of how to do a thing or how you, you choose to approach painting this style, this color, this whatever. Um, it's through a bunch of that trial and error and iteration um, from our own experience, right? And other things we've absorbed from watching others, from learning from others, from watching other people's videos. Like we're always, we're not devoid of, of information intake. Um, but we're always, it's always under the lens of a, how our own brain works and how our own brain learns. Mm-hmm. And so when you can get others' perspective, you can you can make something more widely consumable and effective in that way and like you said we we simply can't do that there's mm-hmm. there's there's just no the communication lines and length of time for those things just aren't possible but in this other medium it could be yeah um uh, another thing that i think would be really valuable one i was like this remember back when i was a kid in game pro magazine and video game makes which the biggest thing I really loved was like do, reading the reviews, right? This was back before there was um, actually had websites that did reviews. And so you really looked forward to games you hadn't heard of 
um, getting good reviews and, and that kind of thing. But mm-hmm. one thing I really remember in those video in those magazines, a lot of them had them at the time, were fan art. So people would draw a picture of like a Samus from Metroid, and these usually kids, and they and they show them and they show these pictures that were submitted. So it'd be really cool at like the back of every episode, it would be user submitted minis, and so you know we'd get. 200 submitted in a month and i say we like we're making this magazine um but um <laughs> but you'd get 200 submitted and you'd have like 10 showcased and it'd be just like sweet mini pictures and a varieties of skill levels too and they can be like oh you also have their instagram handle or you could have like their name and like uh, maybe a little quote of you know billy's 12 this is his first space marine mm-hmm. you know like just one little thing under those and i just think that that would be valuable. And I'd smile every time I'd look through those. Yes, we have Instagram. Yes, we can go through things. But also, those sites often very much limit based on the algorithm for your preferences of what some third-party company wants you to see. It's really refreshing to be just like, oh, I would have never known this kid existed and mm-hmm. I would have never seen his stuff. And, and well, now I got an Instagram for this guy's awesome-looking zombie he painted and now maybe I can follow him. Like I just think that viewer connection of wiping clean the internet like search history of everything that you've done and tainted what you're allowed to see <laughs> feels like being like honestly being retro like like vinyl like, like there's so many things that are coming back around that are that are now popular that are people pushing away from the electronic cord attached to you is 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 kind of refreshing and Maybe magazines. I mean, it isn't. It isn't because at the same time, like people are really getting into shorts content. And uh, maybe you don't. Uh, maybe you say it's going away, but I, I don't think it really is. And and to me, that's a an, a a frustrating example of people's attention spans shortening. And so it's like, yeah, people are getting into vinyl. Like, it's kind of crazy how much vinyl is at Target. You know, it's yes. like, why? What is going on here? Uh, but at the same time, it's like they watch content that's like 30 seconds long because that's, that's kind of like what's on the rise and popular. So I kind of see both sides of the coin here. I don't know how to feel about that. Yeah. It's well, I don't think it's like people are degrading with the with the short form content. I think that that, that We're is becoming subhumans. Yeah, I think that's finding a finding a wavelength on the way human brain works and and feels this instant gratification not dissimilar to the way that gambling makes you feel good or like eating something that's extremely unhealthy but just gives you good chemicals in your brain like that is exactly what the short form content is is constantly giving you satisfaction and moving on and then hitting the next satisfaction and hitting the next satisfaction that is a there's a lot of fucking biochemistry okay. shenanigans. This is the corner that. we need with you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you love talking about Cro-Magnon, man, yeah. and fucking. I always forget the word. What's the word for like the history of humans and stuff like that? What is that called? Uh, uh, anthropology. Yeah. So th- okay. Every episode we get an anthropology corner with John. <laughs> this is definitely it. Uh, I, I, okay, so I, no, I stand. I stand behind. It. I, I'm not saying we need to make a magazine, but every time we do one of these things, we're gonna do a thing. I'm always like, we're making a fucking game. <laughs> <laughs> I think it'd be cool. Uh, I've learned a lesson about myself, and that is that whenever I want to try something new, it's like we're gonna do this for this amount of time, and if it's if it works out, then we'll keep doing it. If it doesn't, we won't. And so, if I wanted to make a magazine, I bet we're gonna do three editions. They're gonna come out and, and like, and then we're gonna have a six month break, and we're gonna assess was that worth it. If it wasn't, we're, we're not gonna do it again. Um, but like, just having that is like helpful for my brain to know there's like an exit strategy. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't feel guilty about giving up or something like that. Right? You know? Yeah. You, I don't have to commit to this until I die. As it's a <laughs> exactly fucking wounded horse that you, I, I just. <laughs> Don't have the guts to shoot it in the brain, right? Because its broken leg will never be healed. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, I've so, been watching a lot of Yellowstone. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I have not. Uh, so another thing that I think suits it suits itself to magazines that does relate to like this like dopamine hit of like cool things is okay. Maybe magazines aren't good at showing the exact process because it's a still image; it's not a video. So lean into that, and also lean into the fact that you have. 10 15 whatever i don't know how many contributors there are in a magazine but there are more writers than just one youtuber with that person's time in a video if if i have a magazine 
I want an article to be about how Eric's Hobby Workshop is making this giant Titan. Yeah. And I'll wait for him to finish it, and then I'll have him come in at the end and give me some high-level, lovely pictures of the process, the final thing, and we get this feeling of being part of that um, insanely long six-month, whatever it is, year-long process where, like, he made this awesome Titan, and we get to see all this stuff, like, right away, and I can read it in a minute and a half. It's like, lean into the fact that you can't show the process and zoom out to show an amazing process done real quick, yeah. right? The behind-the-scenes thing that... There's so much an example like that's a perfect example of things that aren't going to make it into the video. There's so many things that if he's making a video on this or when I think of Squiddy doing any of his massive projects, there's probably the things that are the most interesting, the most that I want to to know about are these like, oh man, this the, when we did this part, it was totally like we didn't know what the hell we were doing. It was behind the scenes things. Yeah. And to just really feel connected to them as a, as a person as opposed to the the polished version of the final product that is in and of itself very awesome very worthwhile watching absolutely yeah but there's this also like i also feel like i almost have this behind something about reading a thing feels like i'm more connected of a behind the scenes you're hearing it in the person's voice right 100 yeah. percent, yeah and I, I feel the exact same way but like i would love to read an article on the Mantis diorama, that was a four-page spread, like mm -hmm. with well, maybe even more, because there's a lot, of, a lot of pictures and there'd be less space to write. But like, it would be so cool to see that just condensed. It, it, it's that kind of like that. I don't know. It's this weird feeling where it's like I get to watch someone make a hut out of dirt and water in 15 minutes, but I know it took three months or like whatever it is. You know, it's that, but in written form, and they can really do that well because that's what it lends itself to. Yeah. Okay. Another thing that I think would be very valuable. One. Um, breakdown of award-winning miniatures when there's competitions they have these Ooh, beautiful yeah. beautiful in pictures things where they're mm -hmm. memorialized for eternity it's the physical thing mm -hmm. and i can go through and be like oh that was the episode where they showed all the golden demon uk winners from 2023 and i can go back and reference that now granted there are some places online for things like golden demon but there's a lot of them that are they're not all in one place or you've got to go to 40 different places to see them and the amount of people that don't see them because they don't know to go to XYZ's website or whatever get to get to see that. So one, seeing um, high-end stuff, and this is like just from a visual standpoint, but two, I really like the idea of having an ongoing challenge. Okay. This mm. month, this month, we're, we showed you uh, the real breakdown of like how to paint na uh, realistic leather satchels. So your test, should you wish to complete it, <laughs> by the next, by the next um, article, here's the cutoff date, is to paint a model with a bunch of leather on it. I don't you know, just whatever, bullshit. Um, and then you, g you give the challenge and then you showcase all the awesome minis that people have submitted from the last challenge. Yes. So you get to show it. You feel like your community, you feel like you're rewarded for, um, you know, taking part in this. And you're also feeling you're connecting other parts of your magazine and the education and the showcasing. And you're offering a challenge to trying to get people to paint. All right. We're making a magazine. <laughs> we're going to fucking do it. <laughs> Yeah, I think that. I mean, I think that's a that's a way better way to encourage people to. I mean, not way better, but uh, I think that's a cooler way to encourage people to have their own submissions in the magazine. Aside from just like like Timmy painted a Space Marine, like check it out, he's cool, he's young. Mm -hmm. I think it's cool to have everyone like striving toward a goal. Like again, like a, a, a constraint, and then how do they work inside that constraint? And then they can you know, show all the creative approaches. I think that's super cool. Um, and that it really inspires creativity in a lot of other painters as well. See how other people approach the same problem. Yeah. Um, I also think cool. that there's cool. a level of when people see it a lot where people are like, I got my picture published in a white dwarf. Like mm -hmm. that's a that's a badge of honor. That's really something to be proud Absolutely. of. Absolutely. And yeah. a lot of people saw this and like in the history of white dwarf that it has this level of, you know, a clout to it to say that I've kind of in a weird way immortalized that I have a piece of me forever in print in the history of this thing this this grand thing and so I think people feeling like I could do the work and I can show it on my Instagram maybe only a couple hundred people see it on my Instagram but like that it's a part of something bigger than you and, and I think something about the physical 
the physical medium adds to it, dude. Like it adds to this level of something to really feel a sense of pride or something you want to work towards. I yeah. think that's really cool. Allow us to get on our old men pulpit for a little bit here, but like I, I advertise sponsorships saying well, one thing in that I say it's going to be on YouTube forever. And that's a lie. You know, I don't fucking know that. I don't have control at on, in the bottom line. I do not have control of my channel. It could evaporate tomorrow. And I could do nothing about it because YouTube has control of that. Same with all online media. Mm -hmm. This is why I buy Blu-rays, okay? No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's not why. But uh, but there is some truth to this. Physical media, things that you control, you get to keep. They're there forever. You're immortalized forever. People buy digital versions of movies on Amazon that they no longer have access to. Guess what? Your money's still gone, but mm -hmm. the content is not there anymore. And so having your shit in a physical format, this is a thing that people who are young uh, are younger, I'm not old, but you know, people who are younger don't appreciate uh, yet until you start to lose things that you have in, in the cloud, as it were. Um, but that, that's kind of a cool thing, too, is that having a physical representation of your achievement that you know for a fact isn't going to go anywhere unless you lose it, burn it, trash it. It's your responsibility. So that that's cool. Your mom threw it out. Yeah, fine. She sold it at a goddamn garage sale. There go all your goddamn ultramarines. Yeah. How about, how, how about there's a little article called Wacky Tool Corner? Where, Wacky Tool Corner? Yeah, where it's like you do a review of this weird thing that either is hobby-focused, that uh, it's just kind of obscure thing, that it's like, oh, it's this, this thing is actually really good for this. Let's show you how I use this weird tool that's made for woodworking that it really helps in my base building. Or mm. it's like, I'm going to do a review of this weird um stupid looking like cat dog water thing <laughs> from green stuff world that's supposed to get my my paint water you hit the button and then the paint water Two out of five <laughs> yeah you get how many tendies does it get right yeah, yeah, the, yeah the crazy tendy tool corner um I, yeah again the more i think about it the fact that there is no main personality and you can have anyone write about anything and that's your expectation as a reader going into this content that just enables so much you can do yeah. whatever the fuck you want as long as it's under this masthead of the hobby and it's interesting right it needs yes. to be both things kind of um you can do a lot of stuff with that with that kind of idea like just like that so it's, it's, very, it's very cool yeah, I think you want enough mainstays that people have this level of expectation of here's what the thing is. Mm -hmm. And I know that 75% of it will be consistent. It will evolve over time, but it's like I know that these these mastheads will always be there, but there's always going to be something interesting or different or new. Mm -hmm. And that other 25% mm -hmm. that may appeal to me may not, but I just always have the option to learn about something a little bit and do I want to rabbit hole it further on my own yeah I think that's a big thing with magazines too is like this is not supposed to be like fighting with your ability to get whatever the fuck you want on the internet it's about curating a physical thing that if you're buying this we know you're a nerd in the hobby and we think you're really gonna find this is interesting and then you can go off in the vast sea and decide if you want to dig in more or not mm -hmm. um, and just live with it on its own. I also like say it like, well, why don't this magazine kind of magazine exist? Well, White Dwarf exists. I don't think White Dwarf actually makes any money, um, but I think it's a thing that probably just kind of breaks even and they have just the amount of a shoestring budget for them to continue it because it's been something that's been there for so long and it's owned by one company. So, you don't get to see an advertisement for army painter in their pages. Right. Yeah. And so I feel in looking through white dwarf, it's always through this corporate lens of what GW wants me to see yes. instead of it feeling like true open press yeah. of it's, what yeah, we really not, feel. We're not beholden to, to it used anybody. To be. People would like convert, orc vehicles and they'd use like pink styrofoam and popsicle sticks and yeah. and elmer's glue and like you would see those brands and those products in tutorials in white dwarf but understandably it has definitely moved away from that uh, uh for now um one last thing i want to mention about magazines Did you know that i ran magazine ads for my kickstarter campaign what magazines uh tabletop tabletop world uh, which actually the source gets an edition of oh. every month or whenever it comes out uh, they have one that's focused more on historical painters and one that's focused more on like uh, miniature war gamers and like like 40k and fantasy and stuff like that um, and like I had to like make 
a, uh, a full page bleed uh, in that by 11 or, or a, a four or whatever it is a size ad and like a, a half page and a banner and like other things they put on, on websites and shit. But yeah, I ran, I ran ads uh, in a magazine for my campaign. Um, and I wish I knew how they performed individually. I gave them a tracked link for the entire marketing campaign that they did for me, which involved putting ads on like spiky bits and other shit like that and Google and Facebook and stuff. So I don't know how much the magazines contributed. Um, but I mean, it was, it was non-trivial. So like, but I don't know if that was all magazine or all website. So I didn't get, I didn't get good data there. Um, but, uh, it was, it was kind of cool to be involved with the magazine process because they needed it by a certain date it needed to be in a certain format, it needed to have like certain guidelines and certain markers on it. So they knew where to put it in the page. It's kind of yeah. cool to be, be part of that old, maybe older process. Did you get a copy of the magazine? So you see I your own didn't, ad? but I, you know, and I looked for it at the source and I couldn't find it. I didn't look very hard, but I would love to see what it looked like in, in real life. But yeah, yeah. you got to get that. You know, to make them send you one. Okay. Something. I'll ask. It says it makes, just brings me back. Um, probably like 15, 18 years ago when I was working at a senior center and I was the marketing coordinator and I was in charge of the newsletter. So I made the newsletter every single month Mm -hmm. and that it required, I was, it was, you know, it's a little nonprofit shoestring budget kind of place. So I'd like, I had to go out and, and get companies to do the ads. And then I had to, I had to, you know, in publisher, I had to like make the whole newsletter i'd yeah. send it to the printers yeah. i had to like write articles i had to like bring in writers i had to like get the calendars of events for all these things it got i tell you this man you uh you have a newsletter for senior citizens uh like 60 percent of your advertisers are funeral homes <laughs> <laughs> jesus hey you're gonna die soon so keep us in mind <laughs> Hey, uh, I want to put this out there. If, if you're the kind of person who would be interested in like organizing like three editions of a magazine or maybe even just a zine, maybe like a small thing, uh, reach out to me, uh, Scott at Miniac.co. I think it'd be cool if I gave someone direction, like let's talk to Jeremy from Black Magic Craft about how it was to make Idols of Torment. You know, like what, right. did, what did he learn? What did he do? What does the game look like? I probably could put together enough references and, and like guest uh, people uh, for someone to go and collect that information, edit together in a magazine. If you have that skill or that desire, reach out to me. I think that'd be kind of a cool thing to look into, guaranteeing right. nothing, but just to look into it. Right. Yeah. I, uh, I more want to know when Jeremy goes into Dollar Tree, like I want to, I want to behind the <laughs> with scenes. What's the top ten Dollar Tree items? Yeah. Like no, it's like I know he's like going in there with a the blank canvas and like, what do you look for at Dollar Tree? What is your brain? Kind of like, where do you have to go to kind of look at things? Well, he's like bring Jeremy me. to Dollar Tree and get like photos and shit. And he's like, he's like, he's like holding this like pack. Like, yeah, that'd be hilarious, dude. I'm honestly, sure. that's a solid video idea. Like, that's, that's 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 a good thing. Dude, Jeremy, make a video where your wife films you <laughs> while you're walking through Dollar Tree. You just don't ask for permission either. <laughs> uh, I'm honestly, I'm surprised at how many uh, things we've mentioned about magazines that really work in the medium. I we had a, a pr- I didn't know what kind of conversation we were going to have today, and uh, I'm surprised at how uh, interesting a lot of the ideas were. That at least interesting to me. Yeah, uh, well, I, I think it's like a lot of these things. I'm like, I'm looking at this through a lens of I wish this came to my doorstop at the beginning of every month. Yeah, because I really think that like even if like oh you know learning how to paint leather. Going back to that example again, I don't know if me personally. I would get a bunch out of that, but I see a lot of people would, or maybe there would be one step in the way that they do leather. That'd be like, Oh, I never thought about that part. Mm. And like, so it's just like you get like a whole month or two months or three months or whatever, how often it comes out to like just ad hoc 10 minutes here or there. I'm sitting in like, I'm waiting for my, my dinner to cook in the oven instead of pulling out my phone and wasting it on time on pulling up apps just to like glance at them and realize that there's no new Facebook messages and then closing it, whatever. It's like I can then reopening it. Yeah. And then <laughs> reopening. And I can just like, I can make it through this one article or just look through these cool pictures again and get inspired or whatever. It's like, I think that there's a lot of value in that. I think that it's not a small hill. No, God, no. Yeah. Because there is like, um, What's that come? What's that magazine? It's like an e-magazine that it's not turn up twenty eight, but it's the twenty eight mag. Twenty eight mag. Yeah, yeah. Like that's one that's very art focused. Oh yeah, and it looks nice. Yeah, but like that's I I want a level of aesthetic of covers of feel of everything that just 
it's nice, mm -hmm. but I want it physical too. And I also, I want it a, a wide range of things because that, that feels very niche and it's amazing at what it does. But I want people that are like, I just, I, I love your every month. I get six, eight pages of really deep dive on how to paint a Tyranid. I love that part every month. But you know what? If you got the magazine, you'd end up like, oh man, there's actually a, a small convention in a town that's 50 miles away. Or like the the absorption of other things that is not your main reason to go, that we're oftentimes put on these rails with these horse blinders, again, with the Yellowstone references, of, <laughs> of our online experiences are tailored to us in such a way that we don't know what other things we'd really like um, if the algorithm doesn't doesn't show them to us. It's like, that'd be really nice to to show people a wide variety of things. Mm -hmm. so. I agree. Look at this. We got a magazine. We got a magazine. We did it. It's done. Goody PP magazine <laughs> issue was zero one. <laughs> so yeah, but it's like I'd say like it's a commitment in that. Like there needs to be a level of uh, investment or people that have uh, publishing experience and that kind of thing too. I think it's a big part of it. It's like, oh yeah. And publishing physical media is not what it used to be, but maybe it's, maybe it's possible. Maybe it's uh, the, you know, the print order kind of a thing with books and stuff for like gaming books is now more accessible than ever. We look at snarling badger and their ability to, kind of self-publish and it's print to order so the costs are low and that kind of thing. Oh yeah, like, there you go. That's you know, definitely like, a solution. Maybe there's there's more economical ways to get it uh your product out there than than ever before. Okay. So we're on to the newsy news first one Hutber Hutber show, the Hutber show. That's a I think it's a YouTube channel yeah right? yeah he has a youtube channel he interviews a lot of uh golden demon painters oh i um, know who that guy is you do yeah <laughs> uh, uh he had so he has this crazy crazy collection of vintage sealed warhammer models and he did this video where he like showed it all and he's like uh taking out of its totes or putting it into its totes in his garden um, and oh, he's God. and he's talking about it at the same time and he currently is selling it on ebay and i have the link right there that he's selling it all for fifty thousand dollar British pounds, uh, not sorry, not, not dollars, um, and or, or best offer. Uh, so this is like a, that was kind of funny. I wonder what he's getting offered, um, but it's just like goddamn, it's so big, and he goes over the whole collection in the video. Yeah. He has pictures of it too in an article. It's really cool. You should check it out. Yeah, it's. I'm sure if it, if it makes him feel better, if he would have put collected uh, vintage magic cards from the same era of that much time, it'd only be worth about a million dollars. <laughs> So by comparison, uh, Warhammer does not increase in value at the same level. Not that much. Shout out to uh, Sam, my business coach, for sending me that link. It was really, it, I thought that was pretty cool. I watched a little bit of the video. I saw, I saw the pictures like on Facebook or something of like this whole like giant U shape of closed totes or with the lids off. <laughs> that's exactly just, what it was. Yeah, it's all that shit. It's like, oh man, that's really funny. Also, like. To have the storage space for that, especially in the UK. I know, yeah. Like they don't typically have a ton of storage, like Murica or, you know, everyone seems basements. to have a basement <laughs> or a giant attic or whatever. But, yeah. Oh, it's, uh, I, hope, I hope it sells. I hope we find a good home for that. Um, next one Verco's Vault. If you've not heard of Verco's Vault, now you can say you have. Neither have we. <laughs> Verco's Vault is officially uh, released notice that it is coming into existence Verco's vault is a las vegas nevada miniature painting museum and we heard about this when we were at lvo we've kind of heard rumors through the grapevine you heard about it at lvo yeah i feel like i didn't hear about it this is the first time i heard about it when i found it on facebook oh yeah this was the i was telling you about this oh. Oh, the 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 guy that has his massive oh, collection yeah, yeah. okay this is that guy okay yeah, yeah, yeah um so there is a Verco's vault facebook page page where they're going to get they're giving updates they're giving a really cool like showing of what really like well done miniatures um are going to be there uh francisco ferrabi recently visited over there and gave or, or donated or i don't know it's just going to have them on display some of his stuff including his crystal brush piece winning of best in show for crystal brush 2018 17 something like that um i, I don't know so there's a bunch of different stuff i know haha's got stuff in there yep so mm -hmm. Um, we don't, but that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still cool because there's not really a thing like this, a physical museum location of miniature art. 
Uh, so it's pretty cool if you're in the area. Uh, it's not out yet. I think it's coming out in a year from now. Yeah, that okay. sounds about right. Okay. But yeah, there's going to be other cool things that are able to be done I- at the museum. Like they're having oh, a whole classroom oh, or like oh. miniature painting classroom. You can teach miniature painting classes there. Um, there's going to be other stuff. I assume there's going to be a gift shop where you can just like buy a Roman Lapot skeleton. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, a one to one. Yeah. But also it's funny enough. If you click on the link and check it uh, check it out, the, uh, proprietor so the the gentleman the that is like starting this uh looks exactly like Saruman from lord of the rings so you, you, you need to know this going in <laughs> yeah so just be wary if you <laughs> be wary of this guy dude's got crystal balls yeah, if you bust out a palantir get the fuck out of there yeah. dude yeah he's just like I see somewhere someone is painting. (laughs) You chose the path of pain. (laughs) Oh, God. Okay. What's next, Scotty? What is next indeed? Uh, The new 40K app is out. And currently, currently, all the rules in the app are free. But James, our writer, has taken issue with one thing they've mentioned in an article. And here's the quote. When a codex releases, you'll be able to input a unique code printed in the book to unlock its content on the app and instantly be able to access new detachment rules at touch. At a touch. James says this. Fuck everything about this sentence. This is exactly the kind of half measure that makes me want to stop giving GW money. To me, this reads, quote, the rules are only free if you don't want to be convenient too." end quote. Um, yeah. That was the same thing for AOS. All of the 2.0 rule books are free in the app. And then everyone that came out after that required a coupon code to unlock it, to look at the, the items, the uh, War Scroll Battalions, all, that, all the rules, all that shit. Uh, so, like, you have, you have the framework of everything on the app for free, but then to, like, actually input your armies to do the thing, you'll need to bought the book or bought the ebook. And then you can utilize that to make it happen. I mean, I get it. I, you know, oh, we wish that everything was free. Yeah, but there's no reason for them to do that. I don't wish that. I wish the PDF or the digital thing for the app was available for five bucks. I don't, I shouldn't have to buy a physical book to also get it digitally. They are putting the two together to necessitate the buying of the physical book. Yeah. Um, which obviously that increases their sales for sure. Uh, I just think it's a cons- it's a bad consumer practice. I think they should be separate to allow for people to who want the digital content uh, to just to have that. Yeah, I would I I'd be all for a one time purchase to to buy this version of the app, and then when Eleventh Edition comes out, or that if, if you make me buy a f- another five dollar app for Eleventh Edition, I'd be fine with that too. Because yeah. there's a one part of it is like if I want to list build, if I want to figure out breakdown of the rules and whatever of an orc army. I don't own any orc models yet, but if I was like can fiddle with your thing and get me excited about it, yes, or to reference some rule about the orcs thing that my opponent is playing. Like, I can do it on the fly, or I can get excited about a new army, I can list build, and I can know what I need to buy yeah. for points and stuff. Like, you're you're actually opening a, a revenue stream for onboarding of people buying more things by allowing them to have access within your own first-party app. And again, if you feel like you need to make money off of that, then just give an upfront one-part cost. I would... Or not. Like, you kind of alluded to this. I would pay, like, you you guys release enough content, like, every month that I'd pay five bucks a month for a Warhammer app that had all the updated AOS rules, all the updated 40K rules. And I could just, like, I'd always know that I had the the tome of knowledge, a representation of the current rule set in my tablet, in my phone. And I'd pay five bucks a month for that, for sure. And, I mean, and this might be, again, this is a lot of speculation, this might be a slippery slope of Warhammer Plus is not doing well. And they need to find a different way from their um, electronics division, whatever they call it, their software division, <laughs> to make more money. To the you got a got a hole we got to dig ourselves out of, and we're not going to do that without finding multiple checkpoints of getting cash out of people. Yeah, I don't actually. I don't know how well Warhammer Plus is doing. I don't know if that information is available anywhere. Mm. I doubt it is because they're a you know tight as a dolphin's butt over there at Games Workshop <laughs> and sharing anything. But I got to feel, especially with Luis leaving, with going to Only Hands, to Peachy sh- leaving. Yeah, to the sheer um, sheer minimal amount of content that actually comes out on it, new content. It doesn't feel like very much stuff comes out on that. Now that, granted, there is some some of those bigger ones and they brought in that, that, 
the dude that made the awesome um his own video or whatever um, i don't know what that was I have, I have no idea what kind of content goes on that platform so I, I don't know how much is coming out at all yeah it just feels like you have to be really really into it to then also have that subscription like wouldn't it be sweet if warhammer plus just like gave you all this for free i would love that i think like, oh you'd get more people on the warhammer plus and see the value of that and i, I might not that. subscribe to it but like if i were a 40k player like fuck yeah i would i would subscribe to that in a heartbeat yeah. um what is next um so we talked in the past about how um battle scribe was having what seemed like an internal conflict between the developers and the original creators or some some group some groups in Battlescribe. And now a couple of apps are swinging in to replace uh, Battlescribe. Uh, new Recruit, Blue Scribe, War, just War, no, War.Cards, and Forces Apps are now taking over the holes left with the uh, descent of Battlescribe. There's a more complete list down in the description below. I don't know if you need all four of those apps to replace just what Battlescribe did. If you do that's not much of a replacement in my eyes um, but maybe those are multiple options that all kind of do the same thing but lots of options for you for your list building uh in the new edition of 40k if you need it mm. uh, a couple of quick things from some hobby companies uh, monument hobbies released their pro krill wash line which i feel like i mean is, while is not new i do, i've had mine for a while but they're nice and send me some things sometimes but i don't know if they're readily available like uh for everybody uh, a black a brown and a flesh um i have moved from my null oil use directly to their black because their black looks works a lot like very similar to the old null oil and the new new null oil one is way too shiny like all their new gw washes are um and also it doesn't Dude, tint, yeah, why? Tint, it doesn't tint as much. Well, because they're using the same kind of process they do with their um, uh, contrast paints. Basically, their new wash, new variations of their wash line are just very thinned versions of their contrast paints. The contrast paints aren't that glossy. They, they're they not not glossy. Yeah, but like, I almost felt like when I used one of those new GW washes that it was almost, it was like on a scale of one to 10, it was like eight out of 10 in terms of glossiness. Whereas where, where 10 is like a glossy wash that they made in the past. So I, I mean, I don't know. Um, maybe it's like different for different colors and stuff like that. Mm. I also like when my washes don't act like oil washes. Cause I want, if I want an oil wash, an oil wash, um, I want them to leave a slight tint over all the surface yeah. and just get darker in the recesses. Yes. In the new GW ones, they slide over the tops too much and don't leave hardly any tint, and then they just deposit. So you get this big stark thing. Mm. It's not terrible. They're not bad. I still use them, but I really like the um, the uh, Pro Acryl Black. It lacks an awful lot, like the old um, Null Oil. Their brown is not a direct color uh, translation to Agrax Earthshade. So it's a different color brown, also cool, but not the same. So just so you know that. But I have heard rumors that um, they're in the process of making another wash that is an equivalent to Agrax, which I would fucking love because I love me some Agrax. So. Uh, the next real quick thing is Army Painter is having a big sale on their first generation speed paints leading up to the launch of Speed Paints 2.0. So you can get them at a steep discount, and there's a link down in the uh, show notes in the video description of that. So should you want to check out that sale and pick one up before they're gone, honestly, probably not a bad idea because a lot of them is like as long as you're okay and understanding um, where they fell off, you can get them at a big discount. It might be worth it for you. Um, so about Army Painter, uh, Jay from Eons of Battle has kind of put a little bug in my ear saying that the Army Painter speed paints dry – not as quickly as uh, contrast paints, which was, which was definitely a problem that I had with contrast paints is that I, they would they just dry super fast and they get the, these tide marks on the model where a wash settled where I didn't want it to wash and I'll go back to fix it and then it's like, eh, it's kind of dry around the edges but not dry in the middle and then I'll get this kind of nasty ring. And so I used, uh, I used Grim Black, which is like their black uh, speed paint uh, on top of gray for my dark bone for my dread abyssal um and i can confirm it, it, it i haven't done any formal one-to-one -one comparisons 
Um, but it, it, it felt like I had more working time with that black. I was able to push it around more, get the effect that I wanted on kind of some of these organic shapes like bone is on that dread abyssal. So yeah, I mean, I'm not necessarily recommending, I don't know what the differences are between first and second gen very much. I think I have the whole box of second gen, uh, not to discourage you from buying this on sale, but if, if you want it, it seems like a pretty good deal. I do believe the first edition still has a decent working time, but I cannot confirm that. All right, from the Kickstarter corner, a lovely segment from our writer, James. He has a little Kickstarter campaign for us called Escape the Book Nook. It's a miniature escape room in the form of a book nook or a diorama that you get to assemble. Uh, 50 bucks for each of these things. Uh, and he says, I have no joke, been waiting for this for months. I've already ordered the Save Watson, and I'm seriously considering adding on the on-air diorama. And so I, I opened the Kickstarter for this to just take a look at it, see what it was. Um, and I was, uh, I was, it was kind of cool. I was pleasantly surprised because I was like, you know, it was like a, a secret room or an escape room, sorry, is uh, something you're trying to, you walk into, orient yourself, and then find a solution to get out of. Whereas this, you're building the room and you're going to know all the secrets. But they changed the process uh, to have you find the secrets while you're building. So it's like they have engineered the process to make more sense with what, with what, the, with what the artistic assembly is. So that's really cool. Like you can like kind of figure things out about your diorama while you're building it. And so if you kind of like, like secret rooms, escape rooms, I keep calling them secret rooms. If you like escape rooms and you like building like, I don't know if they're like, they're like one to 12 scale dioramas, uh, consider one of these awesome little uh, escape room book nooks recommended by our writer, James. You done yet? Uh, choose my favorite color. I think I got to be close. Okay. 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 <laughs> I can keep going. I don't care. Um, oh God. You undoubtedly belong to the nomads. The no, I like the nomads. They're like the kind of reddish faction. Yeah. Oh man, if I had to pick green instead of red. Okay, what? Well, let me let me see. Oh shoot, I want to see C in store. Oh yeah. Okay. Puppetacia Company, Riot Girls. What'd you just say, Puppetacious? Co what? That's what they say. Um. Okay. I I dig I dig this aesthetic. I dig these guys. I pick close combat weapons. The funny thing is they have like question of like which is your which uh TV series appeals most to you. Oh. So I could pick from like Peaky Blinders and House of Cards and <laughs> all these weird shows and I was like, god damn, that's kind of sweet. Yeah, there's a, some of these are pretty sweet. Okay, they weren't bad. They, they didn't give me the the samurai ninjas, <laughs> which I feel like is 100% me, but this this is actually really close aesthetic. Like they're robots. I freaking love for this this aesthetic, the nomads. Maybe they wouldn't give me a um, give me the JSA because it's like a sub faction. It's not like a main supported faction. They, yeah, they probably, yeah JSA might, might not be an option in this test. Yeah, that makes sense. So anyway, I I passed the test. I what, mean, did, what did you say if you saw someone stealing? What would you do? Uh, I said something along the lines of like. Humanity is shit. That's exactly what I said. I was like, I continue doing what I'm doing. Humans are the fucking worst. Yes. <laughs> yep. That's hilarious. Yeah. Okay. Good. Which which faction did you get? I'm doing it right now. I'm on four. Uh, but uh, okay. So I love these kinds of courses, though. Well, Scott does that. I don't know if we have any more newsy news, but uh, um, I don't know what I wanted to talk about. I'm just so I don't need to do this. So course. exciting. No, it's not that. It's, it's like 10 questions. It's the hardest part is some of the questions, they're like long questions and then long answers. But then as you get towards the end, there there's some pretty close ones, pretty pretty short ones. So, yeah, we're going to, after this, we're going to have tacos. <laughs> we're going to have tacos for lunch. I don't care where I am as long as I have a good internet connection. <laughs> that's, that's probably pretty good. I did not have that answer, but that's a pretty good answer. That's honestly my answer, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so we're going to have tacos for lunch. Yes. Um, I've been playing more Diablo 4. I've been really enjoying that. Although kind of getting to a point in Diablo 4 where I, uh, like you can see, you can start to see the matrix. I usually get this way with online games especially, but I tend to like do it to myself in every video game, and it's kind of like my own downfall. Well, I play the game long enough, and I can start to see the matrix, meaning I know what the end game or what's happening or I could kind of like see the behind the scenes, how their systems are set up and how that makes the game play. And then oftentimes once I realize that it like the game loses luster to me 
where it's just like, oh, now I see it all. And I'm not, I kind of move myself away from just enjoying the playing process. And I'm getting a bit of that with Diablo 4. Um, but I still am enjoying it. And I was like, ah, I see it for what it is. And I'm still going to enjoy it going through to the end game. So I'm like level 62, 63 or something right now on my rogue. So, uh, yeah, I, I need to. Luckily, I've been playing it less over the last week. As usual, when I get some kind of forced break from a video game, it like kicks me free from the consistency and the habit. And so when I was gone for three days of vacation, I obviously didn't play Diablo at all. Came back, and so my drive to play it is a lot less. I played it maybe a little bit a couple days this week, but I'm like, ah, I could see myself just weaning off and just stop playing. Weaning is such an ugly word. Uh, anyways, I got combined army what a fucking lame name dude dude yeah they're just like ah we're just a bunch of regular ass people that all got thrown together here i don't know if they're regular ass people but they're a bunch of people that don't belong together put together did you pick green no i picked fucking red bro wait i didn't even get a color question oh you didn't mine the last one was which color do you prefer mine was weapon like what weapon i got weapon too Oh, okay. It was, the, it was after that. Yeah, dude, they were like, yeah, you don't need a car. Yeah, it's this guy. We got to figure it out. Uh, anyways, that's a cool thing you can do to figure out which faction you belong in the Infinity it, Universe. It's pretty fun. It's it's not it's not like a half-assed No, it quiz. isn't. Yeah, it isn't bullshit. Yeah. It's pretty sweet. So we'll put the link down to the Infinity Quiz for you uh, down in the show notes in the video description so you can check that out yourself and then scroll through and see how well they designed an army that you like. Welcome to the end of the podcast. Thank you so much for sticking around all the way to the end and listening to us yammer on about yeah. Diablo and fucking toads and shitty math. Yeah, that is that is the number one thing that you can take away from today's episode is... You're not bound by the laws of any man. No. <laughs> yeah. We make a make-believe magazine about mini hobbies. It's going to be the best one. <laughs> the best make-believe magazine. The best make-believe magazine. Just like the best make-believe TV show. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, the best make-believe miniature game. Yes. All of these things. We made the best ones. <laughs> there was an award for make-believe. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be number one, baby. Yeah, dude. And on the top of that trophy would be a giant fucking cane toad. <laughs> <Yeah>. Woo! <laughs> it, it, oh, I just thought my brain went from cane toad to canes. What if there was a canes toad? What if the actual, like, the, you know, they have the mascots, Ronald McDonald. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't the, it wasn't the cute King. gold retriever. It was some fucking gnarly looking necromancy toad. Yeah, dude. It's just giant. That would he, work well, I think. He looks over us as we eat. Yeah, this is good. This will, this will be good for Canes and their marketing, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, we'll have our people reach out to their people. So the good thing is we don't have to chill for you at the end of the episode because we did it in the middle. So, there we go. you know, no shilling for you today, but we're going to catch you in the next fortnight on the podcast known as trapped under plastic and we'll see you on the liberty flop